long days, pleasant nights, and welcome to Kingslingers, a doof media podcast journeying through Stephen King's Dark Tower series. My name is Scott Daly, and I am your host. And it's been a long journey. We've we've podcasted our way through two worlds on planes and trains. And, and automobiles. And, and automobiles. But but look there, Matt. I see it in the distance. It's our dark tower. And of course, by that, I mean, we finished the book. We did it. Holy shit, Matt. We did it. It, came, it kind of snuck up on us, didn't it? It really did. It really did. I kind of like we've seen a lot of posts from all our listeners um, about how like surprised they were that we're already at the end. And I was in the same place uh, I didn't, mm-hmm. because I think our show is going to go on. It just doesn't, it didn't feel like the end as much until I opened my book and started reading those final pages. Um, and then it kind of hit me all at once. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel like uh, when we finished our Worm podcast, that felt like the the ending of something massive. But for this one, I'm actually more like, oh, but we, we're just going to keep doing Stephen King books. So yeah, so I don't have to feel bittersweet about this. Like I'm, okay, great. We finished the Dark Tower. We get to talk about that. And then we get to do more stuff. So mm-hmm. um no, I'm just I'm just kind of psyched actually and and really looking forward to talking about this. See, this is music to my ears, Matt, because I I I for the longest time wanted to bring you to the world of Stephen King and I just don't think there's a better way to do it than through this series. Um now you've grown to appreciate who he is as a writer, who he is as a storyteller and and we can expand out. Um but but we're not done quite yet. We've got nope. to talk about the end of this book and of course Gosh, we we still have another whole book to talk about. We're going to talk about the wind through the keyhole once we're done with this book. And we've got to talk about the short story, uh, The Little Sisters of Illuria. Um, those are both things we're going to be doing before this season is up. And then season two is more books. So not done by a long shot. Speaking of Stephen King, we just released our episode of Other Levels of the Tower, the patron-only podcast where we discussed uh, the film Misery. Yeah. Go check that out if you're able to. I enjoyed that conversation a lot. I think that was a great conversation. It was really great talking. I love when it's just a movie that you and I just both kind of completely agree on that is excellent. Um, yeah. And we just have a lot of things to say on exactly why it was excellent. Really fun conversation. Absolutely check that out. If you're already a patron and you haven't listened to it yet, what are you doing? Just yeah. go to patreon.com slash media. It's right there. Yeah. All right, um, Matt, we're going to do something a little bit different today because this is the final episode of the final book it felt weird for me for us to go through and have this long conversation about the end of the book and then go to a discussion question and be talking about Susan or Susanna and Oi again. It felt a little weird, right? Mm -hmm. So this time and only this time, we are going to start the show talking about last week's discussion question. We're going to go through all of your answers to our question. Uh, We're going to talk about them for a little bit, and then we are going to move on to the discussion at hand. Um, If you are one of those people that doesn't want to listen to this part we are going to put a timestamp in the show notes where you can jump right to when our our discussion of the story itself starts um but i urge you to to not skip this part because a lot of our listeners spent a lot of their time to send us these excellent answers and we want to reward them um but by talking about them and and by getting you guys to listen to them so please don't skip it but we understand that some people want to just get right into the meat of it so we're going to give you that option uh if you want it yeah All right, let's talk about last week's discussion question, Matt. Last week, we asked, what is your favorite Susanna Odetta Detta moment in the Dark Tower? You can choose any of those three characters or one that encompasses all of them. And as a little side question, we also said, talk to us about your favorite good boy, Oi. Um, And some people took us up on both of those questions. Yeah, um, I'm looking forward to this. So first we have from Megafire. They say, my favorite Susanna moment is this book. (laughs) <laughs> You've mentioned multiple times that Susanna seemed to get a lot less focus than Eddie and Jake, but this is in this book, she's finally gotten the time to shine, and it allows us to spend the entirety of hides in her head. And it turns out she's actually really interesting. Watching her do that heavy physical labor so mechanically was really immersive and made me respect her a lot more. Although special mention needs to go to her line right before leaving, then I'll light the darkness with thoughts of those I love. What an unbelievably badass line. I had to put down the book for a bit after reading um, b- because of how much that hit me. Yeah, the, the context of that line is basically Roland is like urging her to stay. 
because he's like, what if that door is a trap? What if it's just going to lead you to toe dash space? What if it's going to lead you to an eternal darkness? Like, what what are you going to do? And that's her response, right? If I'm stuck in eternal darkness, then I'll light the darkness with thoughts of those I love. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. Amazing. Yeah. Um, Megafire also made a comment about rereading the series. Uh, it was a really good comment, but I wanted to save that part, Megafire, for our talk next week when we're talking about the book as a whole. Um, I think that's a really great way of like wrapping up the story of this book in particular and the story of the whole series. So we'll circle back around to that in within the next couple of weeks. Sounds good. But next, let's move on to Pear Jane, who says, before moving on to my favorite moment, I wanted to suggest an angle on Susanna's role in Ka. Jake was looking for a father. Eddie was looking for a father or a brother. Perhaps Roland was looking for a mother. This is this is a what to do with Susanna, right? Her own journey is to balance her internal selves. But the reason Roland drew her may be that he needed a mother, one who was both hard and soft, who saw him exactly as he was and wouldn't take a shit, but would still love him without asking anything in return. Susanna's talent is to see, and she brings grace to Roland's life without thinking. Her instinct to wash Patrick's hair, to add small moments of thoughtless thoughtfulness to their lives feel very maternal to me. And she literally was pregnant in grave birth. And she leaves him, which is what parents are supposed to do. They're supposed to let go of their children, however bittersweet the letting go may be. Susanna recognized that her own journey was complete and knew that her deal Roland didn't just didn't want to say goodbye to her. So she took her leave of him and as he begged for her to stay. If we've lost parents or have seen our parents lose theirs, we can recognize that moment. Uh, Before we go on to her uh, discussion question response, I just wanted to comment on this in which I I think I think Jane's on to something there. I really do. I think there's something to this. Yeah, no, that, that feels really good. I, I remember we talked about that and, and I didn't really feel too confident about why, why was Susanna drawn exactly like why, why mm-hmm. her, what, what is her role? Uh, you know, what, what purpose does she serve role in the journey specifically? And I think that this, this feels really right to me. Yeah. And if there's one universal truth to, to Roland Deshane, it's that he's got mommy issues. Um, so uh-huh. having having a character like this to kind of slot into that role um, seems to fit very well. I like that. And of course, yeah, like the, Susanna's big thing. I mean, her one of her alter egos is Mia, mother, right? Like this is I, I, like we talked about on Misery. Stephen King is often not subtle. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, and so I think I think you're onto something here, Jane. I like this reading a lot. Yeah. All right. Now let's talk about Jane's answer. My favorite Susanna moment could be a spoiler, but as Matt has read the end by now, it's not a spoiler anymore. There are certain passages of Kings that I reread at least twice before moving on. And Susanna's reunion with Eddie and Jake is on the top of the list. It's so cinematic and beautifully written. And every time I read it, the moment she sees Jake and realizes this world she's in features both of them whole and perfect, that this is Eddie as he's always been a big brother, not a little brother, that he is not the victim of the great sage and eminent junkie. Then not only did she get back, her eddie but she got back her jake too just fills my heart with such joy that it brings me to tears every time yeah um we we're gonna talk a lot about that but i i agree with you jane that this is a really wonderful moment in Susanna's space oh yeah sure i mean it's it's the the culmination it's heartbreaking Mm -hmm. and heartwarming and all those things at the same time Yeah. yeah definitely All right, next, uh, Brett7921 says, my favorite Susanna moment has to be her first time using the gun as a gunslinger. And it just so happens she saves Eddie's ass from Shardik, the mad cyborg bear. She tries to pass the responsibility to Roland, but he is not in a position to, and he has faith in her to to do the deed. Susanna is frightened, but she does manage to shoot off the little metal thinking cat very handily. That just goes to show how much of a badass gunslinger she has become. Mm Mm-hmm. Or she is to become is actually what they said, which, yes. which is which is true. Yes, that that's that's the first moment. I I agree that that's that's very fun because it's like Roland has has like taught them to shoot without actually letting them waste any bullets somehow. Yeah, which which just strikes you as one of those like that doesn't sound very realistic. But then again, it is Roland, so I'll <laughs> I'll, I'll buy it. Yeah, um, I'm in my audiobook reread of the series. I've made it to book three, and I actually just listened to this moment yesterday. I think it was. And man, does it work. It's just really, really powerful. I'm loving the audiobooks, by the way. Mm-hmm. I've never I've never fully listened to the audiobooks of this series, and I'm really, really loving it. Um it's, yeah. it's been great. And this I'm, moment, this moment just fucking works. Yeah, it's just uh God, you're 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 in luck. You get to listen to the whole I mean the the, the Frank the Frank Miller part is obviously the best, but the whole thing is great. Mm-hmm. 
Dark Gazing says, I don't think Susanna gets more awesome than tackling a world that has moved on 30 years since she was last there. On feet she hasn't had since she was a kid, simultaneously fighting off both the hostile intruder in her body and onset childbirth of a demon baby, or Dan Titty, as he is known in the doof speech. <laughs> in a world of split-second sharpshooters, I can't comprehend anything more badass than that, and it made me wonder if Roland could even do it. Yeah, that's, I mean, he he doesn't really, right? The only time we see Roland kind of have to navigate a world that he doesn't understand, he's got a lot of help. Like, either he has the the Mort dictionary that he's able to call on, or he's just being led by someone else who is able to assist him. He doesn't really have to do it on his own. Yeah, that's a good point that, like, uh, Susanna is, is hyper-competent in a way that is so effortless that it doesn't, it just feels mundane. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Whereas Roland's hyper competence is a lot more in your face, um, but that's <laughs> yeah. that's that's good. Yeah, I like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Walking dude says every single oi moment was wonderful. Of course, the, the, they say of what's to come so far. I think my favorite is in his response to the greeting of the Califulcan. I love that as an audience, we never know for sure how much is how much is sentient behavior and how much is parrot talk. I lean toward the former. Then, of course, there's always response to Jake's sacrifice. Poor little Oi, so heartbroken and so limited in expression. Every Oi moment is the answer. And then uh, they also go on to say, The Lady of Shadows has moments that are tougher to choose from. She embodies at least four characters, each with great moments. So while I am tempted to pick that baby-eating moment of Mia's in Wolves, (laughs) I choose not to pick it. I enjoyed seeing her demonstrate skill with the Ariza plates. They were four special. But like Oi, pretty much every moment is wonderful. Yeah, yeah. That's God. I mean, the, the the book is so full of great moments. This, this whole conversation is just going to be us being like, yeah, yeah. That was another yeah. great moment. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. Good, I agree. Good point. It's great. Yeah. It's all great. It's all great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I like this because we get to relive these moments, though. It's been Absolutely. a while for some of these. For um, Al eighty four double oh one says tissues up, please. Oh no. Always finest hour can be summed up in two words. I ache right up there with the ending to that Futurama episode with Fry's dog. Why did you do that? Oh, that episode. Yeah. You know, that episode was just a kick in the nuts though. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas this, this, you know, there's meaning, there was meaning to this. The Fry's dog thing was just like, let's just, let's just hurt everyone. Let's just, yeah. let's just hurt him. Yeah. Anyway, I think you're going to get a lot of angry people that are saying you're being critical of the Fry dog episode. But, uh, I mean, I mean, I, so, sort of. I mean, I love that. <laughs> I, I I love Futurama actually. Um, but like, what is the moral of that? Like, don't leave your dog to die. I, I don't know. Whatever, it's fine. Yeah, obviously, the moral is don't get trapped in a one thousand year uh, freezing device and leave your dog behind. Yeah, I think obviously. it's just it's just so sad that it makes me upset, and and thus I lash out at it. That's um, fair. That's because that, that's how I deal with my emotions is that as I lash out angrily anyway. Don't we all? Yeah. Don't we all? Um, they all go on to say, I'm also partial of how he got his monocle moniker here, boy. Oi. <laughs> or if we had to fill our sad times, we can recall the moment he barfed a mouthful of Turkey and shouted an expletive in the backseat of an SUV. Every oi moment is equally the best thing that ever happened. Um, They go on to talk about Susanna and say, I agree that she may be one of the most criminally underused characters, but in retrospect, her rap sheet is nothing to sniff at. Originated the racial slur honk mofos, shot Shardik's radar dish, fucked an invisible demon into submission, solved Blaine's first riddle of the prime numbers, arise a tossing badass, definitely did not eat a baby in the Kala, birthed a demigod, buried a husband, had the strength to cry off the tower. What she lacked in the bottom half of her legs, she made up for with her heart. That's beautiful. Yeah. No, that's, that's, I mean, I, I, it's it's funny. I kind of just popped into my head when we were talking a second ago about how her hyper competency is, is kind of downplayed as just being like, well, of course she can do that. But Mm -hmm. like, yeah, this list of all of her accomplishments, it's like, oh my God, she's, she's amazing. Right. She is absolutely amazing. And I Um, think the, I think the last one is as kind of, we'll see this week is one of the most impressive ones of all that. Like having the ability to look at a tower and just go pass yeah it's a, it's a pretty big deal as it turns out yep uh tasha bex says again every moment with away every moment with away <laughs> brings me so much joy one of my faves is after the high drama of crossing the bridge to lud and oi had to hang on by biting jake's hand 
The whole aftermath gives me goosebumps as I remember it right now. Jake's wounded and in pain, but hugging Oi and protecting him from Roland. It wasn't his fault, it was mine for forgetting him. A bit later, Roland wipes Jake's blood from his mouth and he looks at Roland with what he reads as sadness and gratitude. When he has led Roland through the sewers under lead and Roland asks him how many people are in the room they have to enter, Oi concentrates with the whole of his tiny mind, does a thoughtful paw-tapping count of the baddies before adding a final ache. Fuck, I love that Bumbler, Bumbler so much. Me too. <laughs> well, I great. love him. He's he's my favorite. Existing Bike says, I really loved the idea of Susanna's Dogen. It was such a powerful move to be able to visualize a way to control her body that way. It, it, it looking like Jake's Dogen gave me the Kotet fuzzies too. As for Oi, every read through, I look forward to his and Jake's body swap as they get through the mind trap. I love how they're so close they're able to do the swap in the first place, so it fills my Kotet fuzzies. But Oi's utter disdain at how Jake can function on his two legged, stubby snouted meat sack of a body is adorable and funny. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's always funny how, you know, o- always a great character, but is often used for comedy, but never in a way that feels like it's at, it's at always expense, you know? Sure. Like there's sure. a certain, I don't know, it's interesting how King maintains a certain dignity to Oi as a, as a being. Um, mm-hmm. Like the, like the joke is never like that Oi is dumb, right? The, there, there may be, there may be humor surrounding Oi, but it's never like, oh, he's just, he's just, a, he's just a dumb dog. Like uh, that's, that's never the 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 way he goes for the laugh and that, that's kind of yeah. cool the joke is almost always that he's smarter than he's given credit for yeah exactly shortstop 88 says i choose to talk about one of my favorite susanna moments or rather one of my favorite detta walker moments when detta pulls susanna and mia into her own dogen in the early moments of song of susanna it might be might be my favorite moment i love the trope of multiple parts of a person discussing with each other uh, within their own head, even if it sometimes isn't realistic to, to, to diso- dissociative identity disorder. It's fiction, so I treat it as such. So this was a lovely major moment for me. It also sparked the beginning of Detta becoming more than just an antagonist or a voice of suspicion uh, of, of suspicious caution in Susanna's head. Detta became an ally, and it led to her eventually becoming more than just her characteristic rude-slash-angry persona, shown by how she helps Patrick in this here book. It shows that by the time Suze leaves Endworld, she and Detta might be pretty close to being one. Truly one this time, not just like the early union between Odetta and Detta back in Drawing of the Three. Plus, you just can't not enjoy Detta saying, let's palaver. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that, that is such a great moment. That is, I, I, for, I forget how great that moment is, but I, I like got chills thinking about it where it's like, you, you don't know where things are going and then, and then like Detta who we haven't heard from in a while steps to the fore and just like seizes the reins of the conversation. And you're like, fuck yes, I'm here <laughs> so for this. Good. Uh, these moments, they're so good. Yeah. Uh, Gerardo says my favorite time with Susanna is right after she's, she's created and she's training to become a gunslinger in the great West woods. I think it showed that she was intelligent, tough, confident, and a quick learner. To me, it seemed that she was recovering from her former self, selves and progressing much faster than eddie who seemed hung up on henry and his constant criticisms being replayed in his head Susanna really shined and passed her gunslinger test when she took out shardik to save eddie from this point on i always look forward to seeing her in action and her role in the cotet mm-hmm. yeah a lot of people like that moment it seems it's because yeah. it's so fucking good yeah for sure for sure um it's very well well executed next owl and olive says since we're talking about Susanna. Does anybody have thoughts on why King named her that? When I first read the series, I thought it was obvious that Roland's new quartet was supposed to mirror his old quartet. Um, no, no doubt Eddie and Cuthbert How dare you, Matt? are twins. And I always thought Jake was like a version of Alain, mostly because they both are, are strong in the touch. So it seems to me that Susanna was meant to be a twin of Susan. I mean, their names are so similar, and they're also the only two females in the group. And the tower was never really their quest. But I could never really make it fit. Like, what was her role and how does, how does she change Roland? Maybe they both showed him um, how to love. Or, since so much of the story is about second chances and how Roland has the opportunity to do things better the next time around, maybe, in a way, it's that he was able to save Susanna's life when he couldn't save Susan's. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think I think there's definitely part of it. Like, I think the, the thing we can declare with utmost certainty is that king didn't like oops into making these names similar right like that, that's that's the type of right authorly choice that yeah. you do very very intentionally and, and Su- susan or uh, susanna herself even says like who is this woman who's 
he's, he's got my name at one point yeah, yeah. um tech, making it textual but but yeah i mean you're right they have they have very little in common um in, a, in an explicit sense it's more yeah. like it, it's it they contrast more than they compare actually I mean, I think if you want to get back into your whole red and pink stuff, Matt, I think you could you could say that Susanna's love with Roland or Susan's love with Roland rather was this young, lusty, like uh, all encompassing physical desire. Right. Yeah. And and through Susanna, I think Roland lear- learns a different kind of love. Um, mm-hmm. It is not a fatherly love. It is not a sexual love. Um it is something different and something deeper and something more. And I mean, if we go back to pair Jane's comment, we can say it is something that's kind of motherly and, and maybe like, maybe that is what Roland was looking for all along. You know, if we want to get Freudian with it, like um, he has this complex, weird, uncomfortably sexual relationship with his mother. Um, The first time he leaves town, he immediately falls in love with this young woman and just like almost tosses everything he is and will become aside for her um only to kind of quickly reverse on that the second something else comes up and then through Susanna he learns how to love differently um and and so much of Susanna's goodbye is focused on Roland and and the love he feels for her and so I think this is a really big distinction of these two women that are named the same that he loves differently one is this much more mature understanding love the other was young impulsive rash lustful um very different stuff yeah you you could even say that that you know taking going along with that parallel saying jake is paralleled to alin eddie's paralleled to cuthbert i'm sorry about why do you keep doing it i don't know it's it's stuck i can't stop um and then susan is paralleled to susanna it's like the, the the newer quartet member heals the wound that was left by the older Oh, I like that. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's it's the most it stands out the most with um, Susan and Susanna because she, you know, he he comes to her with these with these wounds of of having killed his mother and having basically killed his lover, and she's she's a woman who basically shows him love and shows him grace, but it's not it's not specifically in a motherly way and it's not specifically in the way of a lover. It's 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 sort of just more like humanity, but with a kind of a feminine cast to it. Um, and, and, you know, just, just love and care and without requiring anything of him. And I think that sort of heals those, those specific wounds for him. And, and I I don't want to get on a a huge tangent, but I feel like you could make a similar case that like Eddie being so much like Cuthbert, um, but, but, (laughs) but, but like, but Roland gets to feel like he, he did something for Eddie. Like Eddie dies saying, you know you know, you, you saved me basically, you know, you, 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 uh, you made me the man that I am. And, and whereas, whereas him losing Cuthbert was just like a purely, it's just like a purely, it was just a loss, right? Mm -hmm. There was, there was Mm -hmm. no, there was no meaning to it. So yeah, I don't know. Yeah. But I think this, see, this is what happens if people fast forward through this part, just to go right to the discussion. This is a great conversation we're having. I do think Roland never learned to appreciate Cuthbert's personality yeah. in a way that he learns to appreciate that through eddie like the, the the quest makes the importance of eddie's personality type very apparent um in a way that i don't think he ever really learned through through cuthbert yeah i think you're right yeah um basically i mean eddie eddie and and cuthbert are both like a kind of door into more full humanity be, like like Roland is portrayed as this guy who like almost never laughs, almost never smiles. It, it takes a long time before you know they soften him up enough that he can laugh at all. And and it's like, well, that's just a huge part of humanity that you're missing if you're not able to, yeah. to laugh and, and wisecrack every once in a while, it's especially when you're like relaxed around your you know basically your family, your quartet. Um, and and so him him always kind of being hard on Cuthbert for that was really just him being you know it's been a long time since we talked about it but this idea of like the the sort of toxic masculinity of like a, of like an ancient you know culture of warriors where it's like you know laughing is for sissies and it's like okay that, that yeah. that's just bad for you that's unhealthy mm-hmm. um, and and these men you know both of them in their own way but I think I think Eddie was the one who succeeded in healing that particular wound of his actually. 
I think you're a hundred percent right. Yeah, totally. Yeah, there, Roland is a, a very like in, in very, you know, gender normative terms mm-hmm. is, is very much like the, the, the hard ass man type of character at the beginning of the story and, mm-hmm. and trained that way. I mean, the glimpses of his society, we get to see instilled this upon him. We're going to talk about a, a, an instance of it in this very episode that where the book kind of reminds us of what the society was like. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, that is not who he is by the end of the book. Like he has, he's changed. He's grown beyond that. Um, cool. Yeah. yeah. Th- thanks Alan Olive. Yeah, that was that was a great discussion starter. Thank you so much. Um, Lincoln C says their favorite Susie Q moment is I kill with my heart, motherfucker, which is, of course, when she shoots Shardik on the the radar dish. And then their favorite oi moment is when he freaky Fridays with Jake and thinks his nose is stupid. (laughs) Yep, I love the people. are. It it is so funny. Like, thank you, King, for allowing us to be in the head of the bumbler for just a brief little bit of time there. I know. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Um. Public Defender 716 says, favorite Susanna moment, throwing the plates. Favorite Oi moment, following Jake's trail in Lud. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah, because Jake hadn't been, or uh, Oi hadn't been around that long. That's like his real first moment of, oh, this dude's badass. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. Steve D says, my favorite Susanna moment is in Wolves of the Callow when she tells the cockatette that she thinks that she's pregnant. Throughout so much of that book, Susanna seems in the background. The time she stands out is when Mia is going on her evening feasts, which is confusing as hell on the first read. We don't know what to make of her, but in that moment, after the long telling of Callahan's story, she can no longer hide her own confusion. This is the prime point of the story in which when it seems like everyone in the cockatette is keeping someone from something, keeping something from the rest, but she is the only one who comes forward. Yeah, we talked so much about this, the this, this secret keeping and the splitting of the quartet. And it is Susanna that that reveals the truth first. Yeah, well, th- I remember that moment being, I, I just think of that as being such a good moment from, from a writing perspective, because you you think you know the direction things are going. And then mm-hmm. it's like, oh, she just she just said it. Yeah. And it, it, it just it's a it's a game changer. And it's also a great character moment because it really reminds you like, oh, I the one thing we forgot to account for in this complicated situation is that Susanna is her own person, which mm-hmm. is the mistake that Roland is also making, obviously. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, all right. Br- uh, Bent Westward says favorite oi moment. I can sum it up in three words. Oi, Eld, thank you. <laughs> Uh, oi introducing your oi, your oi by the way matt just spot on just <laughs> oh, spot you. on thank you oi introducing himself in calibrin surges as a full-blown member of the quartet bowing with palms up was a thing of beauty that practically jumped off the page jake was described as thunderstruck and equally thunderous applause from the califolkin really accentuated the feeling of awe throughout wastelands we were introduced to oi as a loyal dog-like creature with some language parroting skills in wizarding glass we spent the majority of the time flashing back and only had some brief surreal interactions with oi on the way to the emerald city the introduction scene in wolves was when i realized much like hobbits that you can learn all there is to know about oi in one month and yet after a hundred years he can still surprise you in a pinch r.i.p oi oh that was great you you got mad on your side with with that lord of the rings quote yeah everything that you just said is correct that (laughs) westward Oh, yeah, they also go on to say their favorite Susanna moment had to be when she turned the tables on the speaking ring sex demon, trapping it with <laughs> Kawitis, uh, <laughs> while Eddie and Roland worked feverishly to get Jake through the door. This was the first time Roland let the Katet take the training wheels off with each member, including new member Jake, having extreme trials and tribulations to contend with. Seeing Susanna channel her inner data on the speaking ring's incubus while yelling at the other members to do their part was her coming out to party as a sorry was her coming out party as a force to be reckoned with it certainly was yes 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 that's that's a very powerful moment because you're just like that's one of those moments where you think back on the book where you're just kind of like holy shit what is this story um yeah. but i love it i love it that's what's weird like so so one of the things that, that you and others you know said to me as we were starting this journey was like man later books get really weird um, and what's funny is like, as we were going through each of the books, I, it, 
everything that was happening made sense at the time. Uh-huh. Yeah. But now that I reflect back on it, I'm like, yeah, I remember the sex demon in the ring and then the, he has to carve a key out of a piece of wood to use to open a door in the ground into New York City. And then I'm like, yeah, yeah that is weird. Yeah, I mean, Stephen King has many strengths as a storyteller, but I think one of his foremost is the ability to get you to buy in to what's <laughs> happening and to present it in a way where you just go, yeah, okay. Right. Um, like, because you're right. Like, when you're going through the book, especially in the manner that we were doing it, none of it seems that outlandish. It's only when you look back on it and go, okay, so the Harry Potter, Doctor Doom, robots were coming to steal the kids to suck out their brains to give to powerful psychics to work on a beam. Like, it's uh-huh. wild. Um, and one of the beam represents the author himself. Like, it, it's only, yeah, like, <laughs> Explaining this book to a person who hasn't read it sounds insane, but it always feels earned and believable every moment throughout it. It really does. Uh huh. Yeah. You just no. don't balk at it. You don't. I, I I know. Like like at the time, I always I was always just like, yep, yep, just uh, <laughs> sure. And then what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's great. Uh, Steve B says, I have to say that my favorite Susanna Dean moment has to be the Battle of Calibre and Sturgis. I think the moment fully cemented Susanna's status as a full-fledged, certified badass. In addition to the ongoing problem of quieting her own inner demon, she had to fight back an additional actual demon, Mia, for control of her own body and fight the wolves with no weapons save for a basket of plates that she just learned to use. Oh, and did I mention she's nine months pregnant to boot? That incredible badassery of what she and the rest of the Katet were able to accomplish on the battlefield only served to make her escape back to the unfound door that much more crushing when we finally learn about it. Yeah, that's that's true. Like, King uses that that just giant shift in tone to really nail the, the defeat because it's this moment of utter victory in which their defeat lands itself. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. You know, this is making uh, this is making me get appreciate this this discussion is making me appreciate Susanna even more than I already did because I'm realizing like if you think about it, it, it all connects together. Like how did she defeat Mia ultimately? She she ultimately or, or, or defeat is maybe even the wrong word. How how did she how did she win over Mia ultimately? It it was basically by it was basically by grace. It was basically mm-hmm. by, by by showing her this vision of of like humanity and and motherhood and love and and that was what like broke mia and and made her decide to tell um you know to tell susanna and and to tell the others like the one piece of information they needed um and you know allowed her to survive so yeah i mean it's all it's all tied up in this idea that yeah susanna is a badass gunslinger but like what she really brings to the table is her grace and her humanity and her love and her and and the strength to turn away from the tower, which is, mm-hmm. I think, related to those things. Yeah, definitely. I think Roland cool. uh, learned a lot from her and maybe could use to learn a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. I'll, almost learned enough. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, Daniel M says, my favorite, and uh, yeah, my favorite Susanna moment is probably her gunning down the little dude who always makes me think of Angus from AC- ACDC, the way he is described when her and Eduardo are, are making their way to Blaine's cradle in Lud. She went full dirty Harriet. <laughs> uh, that's great. As far as always, though, too many to really nail it down. Him winking at Jake when he is tasked with waking him up when the moon was up gets me. Him telling Ka to shut up. Their trap is gold. Making <laughs> Roland put some respect on his name, leading. Th- make, sorry, making Roland put some respect on his name, leading him through Lud was awesome. Though Roland did immediately think he was sending him to his death. <laughs> <laughs> leading to okay, his... daniel's just listing every single eye moment here yeah, i see what the, you're doing yeah, daniel this is, this is just yeah this is just everything <laughs> yeah the, the 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 bowing to the califalcon um mm-hmm. not going down when dandolo kicked him um instead three stooging his ass by crouching behind him and letting Susanna push him over man i forgot <laughs> about that that is so yeah good. yeah we didn't talk about that on the show that was really great yeah um putting the herd on mordred um and blowing up his whole plan uh, but the one that gets me the most, Daniel M says, uh, is probably going to be echoed on the broadcast. Jake's whole death scene gutted me more because of always sadness mm-hmm. than Jake's actual death, I think. I yeah. ache. I just wish we got to spend more time in his head the way we went uh, into the dog's head in Under the Dome. 
at least we know he's on the wheel. He, he, he is on a wheel and he is going to come back and hang out with Jake and be part of the Ted again and again and again. She should even talk about torture. I don't know what Daniel's talking about. Yeah, that's that's a very cryptic statement, Daniel. But I, I you know, I, I, th- I think I understand what you're t- talking about. <laughs> uh, finally, we have Eric T, who says, Poi, "Pour one out for Oi, just a class act, noble and faithful to the end." Favorite moment besides all of them? Probably not licking Jake's blood off his lips after almost falling outside the bridge to lead. But that was just his most unbeastly moment. Everything with Oi is gold, ring-eyed gold. No. <laughs> uh. It feels like we're done with the podcast now, Matt, but we are just starting. Um, thank you, everyone who sent in those discussion question answers. We really, really do appreciate that. More discussion questions are to come as we go through the next few books. But for now, it's time, Matt. It's time to finish The Dark Tower. All right, let's do it. Let's begin with Chapter 3 of Part 5, aptly titled The Crimson King and the dark tower and as we begin this chapter i just want to talk about how much i love the opening little section of this chapter king is both aware that this is the end but also aware that we are aware that this is the end and so he begins this chapter not in roland's point of view but again in the narrator point of view in fact he positions the narrator and the narrative as if we are in the space on the path just a little bit ahead of roland and he's walking towards us and it's just a really powerful moment here i want to read this this bit we stand at the crest of a hill and wait as he comes towards us he comes and comes relentless as ever a man who always learns to speak the language of the land at least some of it and the customs of the country he is still a man who would straighten pictures in strange hotel rooms much about him has changed but not that He crests the hill, so close to us now that we can smell the sour tang of his sweat. He looks up, a quick and automated glance. He shoots first first ahead and then to either side as he tops any hill. Always con your vantage, was Court's rule, and the last of his pupils has still not forgotten it. He looks up without interest, looks down, and stops. After a moment of staring at the broken weed-infested paving in the road, he looks up again, more slowly this time, much more slowly, as if in dread of what he thinks he has seen. And it's here we must join him, sink into him. Although how we will ever con the vantage of Roland's heart at such a moment of this, when the single-minded goal of his lifetime at last comes in sight, is more than this poor excuse for a story man can ever tell. Some moments are beyond imagining. I, there's so much to love in here, Matt. I mean, I want to kind of talk to you about the returning to the image of a man straightening pictures in strange hotel rooms, which is an image that I think spoke just so strongly to both of us when we first met this man. Um, And we see here, I love that. I love the, that we make sure to understand that he has changed. He's changed a lot over the course of these seven books, but that part of him, that core of him still remains the same. Yeah, that's, that's very cool. You know, he's he's still the guy who, who will right or wrong if he sees it almost compulsively. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, um, yeah, I mean, there's so much, there's so much to say about this, right? This is, uh, uh, the whole intro bit here just it had me smiling because King is, mm-hmm. you know, he, he's saying in that fourth wall breaking way that he's played with throughout the series, he's saying, This is the end. I'm going to tell you how the story ends now. So let's step back from the story for just a moment and acknowledge that together. Let's do this very intentionally as, as you know, as we turn the page and begin the end of the story like consciously note that that's what you're doing. Don't just, don't just kind of blast through it. Um, and, and I, I really actually kind of appreciate that he does this. Like yeah. it makes it seem so much more meaningful. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because it's, it's, it's written in a different tone. It's written in this, it's a different tone. It's a different language style. It's very flowery and beautiful. And he's, he's drawing your attention to it. And he's, you're right. He's kind of making you slow down and say, but Hey, before we get to end, let's just stop and, and look at Roland again before he takes these last few steps. Let's just reassess our understanding of who he is as a person. And and this is this is it. This is that moment. And like we're we're reassessing him, we're preparing him, we're preparing the moment. And I think I to speak honestly, I was very nervous about recording this episode, and I'm still very nervous about how good it's gonna be because I, I feel the pressure of our show sticking the landing on this finale of this book, right? I want to be smart and clever and have fun and interesting things to say about the end of the story. I know you do too. 
And so I can imagine what the author of the story felt as he was sitting in his room writing the final pages, right? The pressure that he felt to stick this landing, to stick these moments, to to make this stuff feel like it was earned. Yeah. And I think I think this final line in this little paragraph here, like, how how can we ever understand Roland in this moment when he sees the single minded goal of his lifetime? It is more than this poor excuse for a story man can ever tell. I think that betrays King's nervousness here a little bit. Uh -huh. um, he, he's how can one how can one properly explain what it's like to finally get to the thing that you've been working your entire life for? And and perhaps you could argue that Stephen King is one of the few people that could accurately explain it because this series is his dark tower, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, you could say, you know, he, Roland probably feels like a man embarking upon the last few pages of the Dark Tower. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, which, I, I mean, I, it's sort of a writing magic trick, too, to, to say, like, oh, I mean, imagine, imagine what it must feel like to 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 see the thing that you've you've sought your entire life. Well, I can't possibly mm -hmm. describe it. And then, but, but then you're like, well, you just prompted me though. You just like, yeah. you, th that was a little shell game you just did. You just prompted me to imagine it. And now I'm imagining it, right? I'm still, yeah. I'm, he didn't tell me what to imagine, but I'm still imagining, well, what, what must Roland feel? We've been in his head for f 5 million pages. We have a pretty good mental model of Roland. We know exactly what this means to him. Yeah. We, we, yeah. we know exactly what he's feeling, right? I mean, King's, I, I think maybe being a little bit facetious when he says like, oh, I can't possibly describe it. Well, the whole, the whole series was describing it. Mm -hmm. This is just the moment when he sees it. We know what he feels. You know what I mean? I, 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 I mean, it, it's not that he's, you know, it's not that this is an unfair trick. It's just like net, once you've established your characters and built everything up to this point, you can do stuff like that where you're just yeah. like, you know what the character feels about this. I think calling it a shell game is so, so, so apt because I think you're absolutely right. It's like if I were to say, I just can't even begin to explain what this giant pink elephant in my room looks like. Uh -huh. You're automatically picturing a giant pink elephant. And yeah. it's like, yeah, it, it works while also drawing attention to the importance of the moment. Yeah. Like, this is such a big moment. I couldn't possibly explain what it feels like. But also, here's kind of what it feels like. Yeah. Right. Yeah, or, or it's kind of like saying, I just can't really, I can't even say how disappointed I am. <laughs> like, okay, you kind of did though. So. Yeah, you really, you really did. Yeah. Uh, so from here on out, we jump into Roland's head and experience him as he experiences the tower for the first time. And here's our first view of the tower, Matt. This is the first time we see the tower, not in a dream, not in a picture, but in the flesh. How much was he looking at? 20 feet, perhaps as much as 50 he didn't know, but he could see at least three of the narrow slit windows which ascended the tower's barrel in a spiral, and he could see the oriel window at the top, its many colors blazing in the spring sunshine, the black center seeming to peer back down the binoculars at him like the very eye of Todash. So this is the first view of the tower in these seven books and thousands and thousands of pages. And what immediately does King choose to focus on here? the window with its colors representing the wizard's glass and the center of that window representing black 13 is then compared to Todash space, the space between worlds or in numerous monsters lives, right? So King has chosen here to attach our first vision of the tower with two of the most inherently evil things we've experienced in the book so far, almost as if Roland going to this tower would be bad. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, there's definitely some foreboding stuff going on here. Uh huh. Uh huh. It's interesting because I'm kind of I, I have I have almost like a Deta Odetta split going on with respect to like how I feel about this this roll up to the tower because mm -hmm. it's so it's just so interesting. So like the, this this is one of my one of my one of the halves of my brain. Okay. So you know we, we're starting from this first glimpse of the tower. Um, you know. One thing I, I, I want to say is like you, Scott, and, and you, listener, you may have forgotten this because you first read these books a long time ago. But um, and, and you know you you've had this image in your mind for a long time. But me, this is the first time I'm seeing it. And so I I sort of subconsciously, maybe semi consciously, 
you know, was looking forward to this moment. I know Roland's going to see the tower at some point. I'm looking forward to that. What is that going to be like? Mm-hmm. You're, you're kind of imagining what is it going to be like when he finally gets there? What is it going to be like when he finally sees it for the first time? You know, you, 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 you maybe, maybe you literally imagine what it's going to be like. Um, maybe it's just kind of somewhere in the back of your mind as a thing you know is going to happen. So you have some kind of sense impression of what it's going to be like. Um, you know, if, if you're one of the people who read the book over many years, you almost certainly had some image of what that was going to be like, right? Because you you had you sure. had so long that you were looking forward to it. You know, some, someone like Scott Wampler, who you know the the series like that they they grew up with the series. Um, anyway, all of that said, what do we actually get? He sees it, and you know, it's the top of a tower. <laughs> like like it's it's such a it's such a physical naturalistic description mm-hmm. yes there's that touch of foreboding there's you know the, the eye of toad ash staring at him but but also like just so so much of the description of the of the of the roll up to the tower is like oh it's a tower it's a physical tower coming out of the plane like mm-hmm. like I, I think part of me just expected it to be this like overwhelming like to to feel more like coming into like mount doom or something where it's like the swelling epicness of everything and and you know gusts of of black evil wind trailing out from it and sure. and in evil lights and lightning and and uh, and and who knows what else like i i just i didn't expect it to be like oh it's kind of like a quiet calm day sun's going down towers there you know yeah i mean the first description of it the very first description is like how, how much am i seeing like 20 mm-hmm. so like 20 feet and it's just like it's he's just measuring yeah it's like how much like and then he talks about the the windows on it and then it's only then that he gets to the the blazing eye of the window yeah it, it's this thing that was described as as being so important and and magical that it it like it it, it defied any any sense of scale and he's like that's oh, about about 50 feet yeah it's about 50 feet okay. um so so yeah but like so that's the one half of me is just the the, the part that notices how like I said, naturalistic the writing is, but then the other half of me notes like, well, it's not purely naturalistic. There, there is foreboding. There is mm-hmm, mm-hmm. he's in a ro- he's in a field of magical singing roses. So it's not like there's no <laughs> magic. Ha- it's it's just not what I expected. You know, it's it's yeah. a very different feeling from what I expected. Yeah, and I think I think Roland would be in a similar place that you are as well because like he kind of thinks to himself, okay, I'm ready for to experience this fundamental change. And he's like, okay, nothing's changed. Yeah. But yet everything has changed still because like he he notes that like physically nothing has changed, but what he felt instead was a queer soaring brightness that seemed to begin in his mind and then spread to his muscles. For the first time since setting out at mid-morning, thoughts of Oi and Susanna left his mind. He felt free. And so it's this moment where he knows that nothing's changed, but also is acknowledging that everything has changed. And I, and I love that that passage itself because like, he's almost celebrating the fact that, Oh good. I don't have to think about my grief for these people that I've loved and lost. Now he felt free. He's freed himself from, from the feelings of grief and, and, and love for these people. And and look, I'm not saying that like you should, you should never let go of your grief. Obviously you have to eventually, but like Roland, it's been like three days, (laughs) like, like just to be like, Oh, thank God. I'm so free of this, the burden of love, the burden of grief, the burden of these things. uh, It's, it's, I don't know. Like I just had a very negative reaction to it this time around. I'm like, really, I'm glad Roland. I'm really happy for you now. Yeah. I I took this as bad. I mean, like, you Mm -hmm. know, I I was like, Oh good. Good Roland. You know, the, the heroine is right there. You'll get to shoot up soon. So you don't have to, you won't have to hurt anymore because you're, you know, you're about to get your drug. Good for you. Like yeah. I, I really, um, it did not seem like a good thing that, that, that was, that this was his reaction was to, to, to feel free of all of his grief actually. Yeah. The world is hard and painful, but here is my release. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And not a good thing. So finally, Roland and Patrick crest a large hill and are able to see the full scope of the tower. They see the giant field of roses and the tower at its center. I want to talk about this description, too, because I think there's some interesting stuff here. The road cut through it, a dusty white line, perfectly straight and perhaps 12 feet wide. In the middle of the rose field stood the sooty gray tower, just as it had stood in his dreams. Its windows gleamed in the sun. 
Here, the road split and made a perfect white circle around the tower's base to continue on the other side, in a direction Roland believed was now dead east instead of south by east. Another road ran off at angles to the tower road to the north and south. If he was right in believing that the points of the compass had been reestablished, from above, the dark tower would look like the center of a blood-filled gun sight. Uh, yeah, I mean, yet again, it's it's actually a lot of beautiful naturalistic writing, but with an edge of foreboding. That the, the mm-hmm, blood-filled mm-hmm. gun sight, right? That's yeah, so so evocative, and so it's, it's so evocative, and it's so it's it's Roland, right? Like, of yeah. course, it looks like a gun sight. Like yeah. that's just Roland defines himself by guns and gun slinging, and and as we'll see to as we'll learn as we go, like this is Roland's tower, um, and so it's just a perfect imagery there. Yeah, he's had his sights on it the whole time too. Mm-hmm. I, I like the interesting, like the compass writing itself, right? Like southeast has been their constant direction throughout the entire course of the series, and now here as they've made the way to the tower he's just traveling east now it's Mm -hmm. like it's like the beam he was on was not the southeast by northwest beam it was didn't it was the east by west beam it's just the compass got all fucked Uh up uh that's that's interesting right yeah sure yeah i I think that's fun another thing that i didn't pull a, a a slide for here but there's a moment where you like see the clouds billowing around the top of the tower and because the two beams are there it makes this giant x in the sky Uh which like could be like x marks the spot but could also be don't no no. (laughs) don't don't yeah (laughs) i mean it's so that there is so much about i guess i'll take a page from stephen king's book and and stop being subtle there's so much here that's telling him no turn back Mm -hmm. (sighs) yeah yeah unfortunately he does not listen So suddenly as they stare at the tower, the insane cry of the Crimson King carried by the beams appears. And as it does, so do the Harry Potter snitches that the king is throwing at them. (laughs) Roland and Patrick duck behind a rock, hiding behind the bombs as Roland shoots the ones that are tracking him out of the sky. And it's here, Matt, where we finally have to discuss the Crimson King himself. Awesome. An old man with an enormous nose, hooked and waxy, red lips that bloomed in the snow of a luxuriant beard, snowy hair that spilled down the Crimson King's back almost all the way to his scrawny bottom. His pink flushed face peered towards the pilgrims. The king wore a robe of brilliant red dotted here and about with lightning strokes and cabalistic symbols. To Susanna, Eddie, and Jake, he would have looked like Father Christmas. To Roland, he looked like what he was, hell incarnate. So, Matt, um, was this what you were expecting? <laughs> uh, you know, I can't honestly say yes, but I think I can honestly say sort of, which maybe people will find unbelievable since I didn't, you know, <laughs> call it. But it, here's the thing, like, it, there's all these little things. Like, so for, for one thing, Roland earlier described him as Jan Capering Goblin, mm-hmm. which kind of injects a certain image in your head of like, well, that doesn't sound very dignified. Sure. Um, you know, and, and then and then the book has been doing this interesting thing where for a period of time, the Crimson King was sort of talked about as if he was Sauron. You know, he, he's 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 fearsome and foreboding and, and immensely powerful. But then we start to get hints that like he's crazy and maybe he's kind of incompetent and his whole organization is full of incompetent people. And like, yeah, he, he's definitely powerful in some magical sense. But we just keep getting these hints that he might not be as as fearsome as we'd imagined at first. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that that makes you wonder, like, oh, is this gonna be a is this gonna be kind of a surprise? And it fits much better with the archetypal king villain, too, that he be, you know, this fundamentally banal monster, this this screeching crazy man. Mm-hmm. He's not like a profound, weighty evil from the outer darkness. He's he's the the the, the shrieking sound i'm not gonna do it because i don't want to hurt everyone's ears but like the the horrible shrieking sound that he does which the the audiobook makes sound just so annoying <laughs> it's so annoying and undignified you just totally lose respect for the guy you, you, any sense of awe and fear you might have had you just like oh this guy sucks yeah um and i think that's exactly what king wants you to be feeling and that's very in keeping with how he's treated all of his villains really in this story 
Yeah, I mean, I think that's the important part, right? I think there is there is a certain listener or reader rather who reads these books and sees this this is the guy, this is the 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 man that has instigated all this is the the primary evil force. This is who he is. He's like a crazy Santa looking dude that just throws Harry Potter things at our villain and then gets erased out of existence. <laughs> and and there is a certain disappointment there. And and I get it. It is as we've talked about in the past, designed anticlimax. Like it is designed that way. But it is true to what King has done again and again and again throughout the story. Every single one of our physical antagonists to our characters on the way to the tower have been disappointing in some way or another. R- Randall Flagg was disappointing. Mordred was disappointing. The Crimson King is disappointing. Even Blaine like loses because of a dumb joke. You talked about Jonas and Wizard and Glass. I mean, the TikTok man himself is just kind of a stupid idiot that gets just destroyed. Uh-huh. Gasher is not anything like none of these characters, none of these evil characters in the story, these great villains have lived up to any of the the name surrounding them yeah and when you know fool me once it's bad writing fool me twice there's a pattern and it's right. doing something intentionally yeah i mean we especially when we just had mordred dying of food poisoning and being yeah. like no this this can't be i am the great mordred and you're like just because you were hyped up doesn't mean you're you've got a destiny bro um, yeah I mean, it's almost as if the Dark Tower is a story of man versus himself, mm-hmm. not man versus man. And so the antagonists just don't matter in this story. Yeah. Like that's, I think, the fundamental point of it is that, yes, they are there. Yes, they help create and drive conflict, but they are not the primary conflict of the novels. And and so in in the resolution of that primary conflict, they are irrelevant yeah well and and they almost always destroy themselves yes i mean we we, i think we said i don't remember whether we did or not but i feel like we said mordred basically is his own undoing because he Mm -hmm. he he gets greedy he forgets about oi he he didn't have to attack but he did and and that that's what killed him and also he didn't have to eat the the rotten horse either but so so like it's it's all his choices right um and then and then the crimson king like an idiot swallowed a spoon um to kill himself and then got trapped on a balcony <laughs> and, yeah. and then and then just kind of threw sneeches until he got erased like 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 all, basically all mo- mostly his mistakes led to this situation and, and his mm-hmm. and his own greed and short-sightedness and just you know um yes it was it was patrick that erased him but it was it was the Crimson King that put himself in such a stupid situation that he was able to be erased. Yep. Yep. Totally. So the gunslinger and the King have a standoff, but Roland knows that time here is not on his side, that the call of the tower is increasing throughout the day. And by sunset, it will be too great for him to resist Crimson King or no Crimson King by sunset. Roland will walk out of cover and towards the tower, which is, I mean, Roland buddy, Come on. <laughs> yeah, have you some know, sense. Have, have, yeah, I mean, I mean, you want him to have some strength, right? But the thing yeah. is, it, if the book has been consistent about one thing is that he does not have strength about the yeah. tower. He, he yeah. is completely weak when it comes to the tower. I mean, he, he's an ultimate badass. He'll crawl over broken glass for the tower. But... <laughs> but for it's for the tower right like that that's the yeah. problem um you know, he, he never at any point did what eddie did and you know sweated out his addiction and, and got got through it he always always folds when it comes to the tower and so in in, in a sense of like character consistency I, I totally believed like yeah he's this is this is the thing that roland would do he would absolutely walk out into the open because because you know the tower has that much of a hold on him he is an yeah. addict I mean, it's understandable, but it's also just so, I mean, disappointing is not the right word. It's just, it's just kind of lame. Yeah. It's just like, yeah, really, bud? Like, yeah. that's why you're going to lose because you just can't sit still anymore. And like, I, I like that Patrick both doesn't understand at all and also kind of understands. Uh-huh. Like, he's looking at him like, what do you mean? Like, I, we're talking about who framed Roger Rabbit this week for the Doofcast, And I just watched it before we sat down. And there's a moment in that movie where like the judge does shave in a haircut on the wall and, <laughs> and the guys and the guy's like, that's not going to work. That's stupid. And then he looks over at 
at the rabbit and who's about to lose his mind because he has to finish the shave and a haircut thing. And that's what the scene is, right? It's yeah. just like, you're really going to come out of cover and let yourself <laughs> get blown up because the tower is calling you. What? <laughs> this That's going to work on you. <laughs> I'm so happy that this comparison has been made. Um, I mean, I, I mean, I, I, I get what you mean. Um, but I just, I, I, I had no trouble buying this just because of, no, but like like using Roland's addiction to the tower against him in this moment felt like the perfect thematic thing to do, actually. Yes, it is thematically and and through Roland's character consistent. But it is just kind of like you're just like, buddy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Come on now. Right. I, I mean, I think in terms of fe- it feeling kind of lame and anticlimactic and disappointing in, in, in an intentional way, like roland is playing pure defense here like he he's mm-hmm. just trying not to walk out into the open and then he's shooting the sneeches which is obviously necessary and useful but patrick is the the clutch player here patch you yeah. know without patrick he'd be screwed so yeah and and let's get to patrick's shining moment here i, yeah. I think this is it's it's just so fascinating the way king chooses to structure this because Right when Roland realizes he can't stand it anymore, he kind of reveals his plan for defeating the Crimson King. You know, Patrick will draw him and then erase him from existence. But King doesn't treat this as this big reveal. He just is like, Roland had figured out how to do this a while ago, but he, he it was his pride that was preventing him from executing this plan because he wanted to be the one to kill the Crimson King himself. So like, Roland has discovered the plan before King allows us it to be in on it. And it's just like, it's not, it's not revealed in a way you would expect it to be like this triumphant moment. And I think it is part of the designed anticlimax of this moment that he's just like, yeah, so I'm just going to have Patrick draw him and erase him. Uh, And I figured this out a while ago, but I didn't want it to go that way. But now I have to, you know? Yeah. It's also another moment that makes Roland look a little bit childish for like wanting, making like sort of making this an ego thing about, about him and his, his victory over the Crimson King instead of just it almost feels like anti gunslingery because I feel like a gunslinger would just efficiently solve the problem in the most direct way. Mm -hmm. Um, Cause I mean like personally, you know, as soon as I realized how sort of underspecified and seemingly very powerful Patrick's abilities were, I was like, all right, so we're going to get to the tower with Patrick. What possible challenge could stand between them and the tower? If you have a guy that can, um, eliminate things from existence with the drawings sure sure so so like i i I didn't i'm not not saying like i saw exactly what was going to happen but i was like well well i mean obviously roland would see the combat utility of the drawing power like immediately um so it's not so like yes i I agree that that the order in which the information was revealed does make it feel kind of like oh okay um (laughs) yeah yeah it's like it's like every, every element of this was constructed so that it wouldn't quite feel like the the awesome gunfight that you that you thought you might get, right? Sure, sure, yeah. Um, so I guess you you didn't you didn't predict it exactly, but you were kind of on to what King was doing here. I, I was curious about that because I don't remember what I thought the first time. Well, I I figured I figured it was going to come into play. I figured his drawing power was going to come into play when it came sure. to facing the king. I didn't know what that would look like. I, I I didn't think in my head, oh, he's going to erase the Crimson King. I, I thought maybe there'd be some obstacle that it would be used to to surmount, though. I don't know how if if you noticed the fact that um Susanna took all the erasers with her into the door. Like this is something no. that King drops like very quickly and cleverly that there's only one eraser left and Roland puts it in his pocket and it's just a little nub of one final eraser and the entire rest of the pack of erasers Susanna has taken with her uh, through the door, Um, which is kind of like, I I wonder if in editing they were like, Steven, you need to put something in here. So like there's a limited number of these erasers or else he just would have, he'd be all powerful. Um, Right. (laughs) Yeah, maybe so. I, I, uh it, th- that does kind of feel like a, the kind of thing that might have been added in editing yeah um, i mean it's the fifth element final match right it's like you yeah. got this one eraser you've got this one shot this is this incredibly powerful thing but you've got one shot at it. yeah one chance yeah i, I think yeah. so i mean i think that nothing about that feels contrived though because Susanna left in in like in such a a rush sort of she was like emotionally yeah, well, anxious she takes know, the gun with she, her too exa- which is exactly a big deal. yeah she takes everything with her and, and then yeah. you're like oh shit 
She took yeah. everything that we, I mean, they, I guess they didn't need the other gun, but um, mm-hmm. yeah, anyway, yeah. I, I'm just now thinking about, we haven't talked about this very much, but but Patrick's power having to do with paper specifically, an item in Roland's world, which has been declared over and over again to be incredibly rare, right? Uh-huh. And it, I think it just elevates his power even more. Like perhaps in, in our world, not, but in Midworld, in this world of no paper, this power he has is in, just like rare and unexploitable in certain ways. Mm-hmm. Like if he didn't have the sketch pad, where is there paper? I guess, I guess in this part of the world, there is paper, but in like mid world, no, not a lot of paper. Yeah. That's really interesting. I mean, we, we are going to, we are going to see that we don't quite know what becomes of him and, and maybe he finds himself in situations where the lack of paper is a problem for him. Yeah, sure. So Roland commands Patrick to make the drawing And even though Patrick knows it will be a difficult one to do, and he speaks to Roland through his mind here, he says, very hard, whispered a voice deep in Roland's mind. It was not the voice of a boy at all, but a grown man, a powerful man. He's not entirely there. He darkles. He tinks. Where had Roland heard these words before? No time to think about it now. Well, Roland, that's what we're here for, to think about it for you, because this is how the man in black describes the ageless stranger all the way back in book one, The Gunslinger. Um, he said that this is the person that you would have to encounter before you faced the Crimson King, the ageless stranger, a man who darkles and tinks. So interesting, right? Interesting. Very interesting. Um, you, you know, you're, you're immediately like, okay, is Patrick more than he seems to be? Um, is there is there some deep layer to him that maybe Patrick himself is not even aware of? Uh, I admit while I was reading, I just blew past this much like Roland does because I wanted to get on with the scene. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't I, like, like I vaguely remember the ageless stranger being a thing that was mentioned maybe a couple, one or two other times somewhere in the story or, or maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. I, I don't have much to say here, honestly. I'm sure this is, is this, a, I mean, now that, now that, now that we're like done, <laughs> and i don't know i still don't know what this is like can i just can i just be like what is this or or, or, or is, are there still spoilers in in the wind through the keyhole that i need to not ask about or there are or? not but i do want to circle back to this a little okay. bit later um okay sure. i have i have theories about this definitely okay. Sounds good. We, we never we never meet a person that is referred to directly as the age of stranger that is something that never happens but but we'll we'll circle back around to this okay so Patrick sets to work on his drawing as the pull of the tower gets worse and worse on Roland. I really, I really like this part. It's been waiting for me, he thought with dismay. That's what makes it so hard to resist. I think it's calling me in particular, not to Roland exactly, but to the entire line of Eld. And of that line, I am the only one left. Um, but it yeah. is, it is calling to you specifically, Roland. Like it's definitely calling to the line of Eld, but hey, you, it's you. Uh-huh. It's just you, bud. Yeah, that's that's so interesting. Yeah. So at last, Patrick finishes his drawing, but the eyes, they're just they're just not quite right. They need something else. They need the color red from the roses. And I love this moment where Roland first wants to send Patrick to pick out the roses. He's like, go, I'll I'll, I'll cover you, which is very Jake like, you know, like like I just remember in um, the the passage under the mountains when the slow mutants put rocks in front of the trolley car. He's like, Jake, go move those rocks. I'll cover you. Uh. And that's <laughs> when we first read it. That's the moment when you're like, okay, so here's where Jake dies. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, and it didn't end up being so, but like you can kind of see history repeating itself a little bit. Patrick, you go get the rose. I'll cover you. Um, and we kind of see textually here that that would have been a very bad idea to do it that way. Uh-huh. Um, but in, instead, Roland decides to get the rose himself, and he plucks the rose out of the ground, and he he slices up his hand doing it. Slices it up really, really badly, actually. Um, Roland pulled his own lacerated glove off of his teeth and saw that not only was his palm badly slashed, but one of his remaining fingers now hung by a single bloody tendon. It drooped like something that wants to go to sleep. But Patrick was not cut. The thorns did not pierce him. Um, so like we, we talked way, way back in the drawing of the three that Roland's right hand, the loss of his fingers on that hand, his shooting hand 
was first damaged as as penance, let's say penance for his choice with Jake, his choice to let Jake fall, to let Jake die. He was punished for that. He suffered and had his finger sliced off. Here we see another finger basically go. And, and we're kind of told here. His hands never going to work again. It's yeah. just, you're, he's never going to have feeling in this hand ever again. Yeah, it's not. It's another another good sign, right? Another sign right. that we're heading towards positive moments yeah right it, it's it's sort of like uh you're, you're you're close to the end buddy who needs hands anymore um you're not gonna need this for long anyway roland mm-hmm. uh i mean that, that was the feeling i got was just like oh yeah. shit i mean you know there's a certain kind of book um some of our listeners will know what i mean where the characters just start dropping limbs toward the end <laughs> um and uh and that tells you i think like kind of the trajectory of the story you know, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah, I, I love the intensity of this moment. Uh, I, it, it really brings me back to the focus and, and vividness um, of uh, Eddie's artistic struggle to carve the key back in um, that book. <laughs> God, the wastelands, the wastelands, uh, bec- you know, King, King exerts so much of his writerly force to get us to appreciate that, you know, the magic of the act of creation um, you know, back back then and here with the drawing, uh, the, the idea like Patrick is going to use color for the first time and, and it, it hits with so much power. There's so much kind of energy put into this moment of, of artistic creation, it, it, you know, the yeah. artistic creation within the artistic creation. Um, it, it just says so much about what King thinks about creation, I think. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. This is really, this is really an important moment. It's a beautiful moment. And, and like we have a budding artist here learning the full scope of his powers and it's i think something that king really loves yeah me too so patrick combines the red paste from the rose petals with some of roland's own blood um and drops the two blots on the crimson king's eyes now the picture is perfect it's done and then patrick begins to erase it and he does he erases the crimson king out of existence all except for his eyes which would not erase um because there's color on it and you can't You can't erase blood with an eraser. Um, So all that's left of the Crimson King is his eyes. And that's how that's how he goes. We've kind of already talked about how anticlimactic this is. But any any thoughts on the Crimson King's death here and the remainder of his eyes? Um, Well, I think it was you that pointed out to me the idea that you've got staring eyes staring out from a tower, which is a very Lord of the Rings image. Uh Uh, um, Yeah. the most direct Sauron parallel. He was already, he was already, you know, his symbol was already the eye, which is also a Sauron reference. Um, but but uh, it's, it's like, a, it's a, it is a reference, but the Crimson King's eyes are useless. Like they just, yeah. they can stare at you. They can taunt you mentally, but there's, he, he can't do anything. Yeah, he's he, completely he, neutered. He's yes, exactly. He's, he's n- neutered and, and yet still trapped forever. And yes. like there, there, there's this sort of even more kind of, twisted implication that like maybe his his body sans eyes is like wandering toad ash in the dark (laughs) forever lost with with, and blind and and well not blind though he can still see but all he sees is the field of roses with no ability to do anything about it and no ability to enter the tower which is yeah it's just the most perfect possible torture right yeah i love it i love that all right so They've won. Roland has the tower now. And as he prepares to make his final approach, he's got to think about one more thing. Yet there was this boy, this friendless boy. Roland would not leave him to die here at the end of End World if he could help it. He had no interest in atonement. And yet Patrick had come to stand for all the murders and betrayals that had finally brought him to the Dark Tower. Roland's family was dead. His misbegotten son had been the last. Now would Eld and Tower be joined. First, though, or last, this. So Roland does what any person who thinks that saving a boy will make up for all the bad things he'd done his entire life. He he sends him off into the wilderness by himself (laughs) with a few cans of food and his magic paintbrush. Uh And that's it. Yep. Yep. It's uh, it's uh, Sylvester in the purple crayon. Is that it? (laughs) It's I a, won't I won't leave him to die here at Endworld, so I'll send him down the road and just assume that he'll be fine. Uh-huh. Sorry, <laughs> Harold in the Purple Crown. Sorry. Yes, Harold but, in the but, Purple Yes, yes. Good job, Roland. Good job. I can see that you've <laughs> truly, deeply learned the lesson that I said I thought you needed to learn. 
Um, and the, the tower will therefore offer you rich and well-deserved rewards when you get to it. Totally. Thanks for helping me, Patrick. You were the way I won. You were the key to my success. Now fuck off. Yep. Good luck, <laughs> yeah. kid. Yeah, I mean, it, it almost like emphasizes just by the fact that he takes the time to say like, oh yeah, I got to do something with this kid. And and it's just like, hey, go get some food yeah. and then go back to the robot yeah. and there's, you'll probably be fine. There's probably some some cans of beans over there. <laughs> Well, <laughs> well, big gulps, huh? Yeah. Well, see you later. <laughs> Do you have a can opener? Do you know how to use a can <laughs> opener? Where's your bean dad? Oh my, you're right. Roland is bean dad. Yeah, Roland is bean dad. Now we know he's the antagonist. Uh -huh. It's all is revealed. Yeah. And then with that said, Roland heads toward the Dark Tower. And, and King makes a choice here, Matt. And it's a fascinating choice. And I want to talk to you about this choice. As... Here in the end of the book proper, not the epilogue, not the coda, but the book proper, he doesn't follow Roland to the Dark Tower. As Roland marches out into those scarlet fields, our point of view stays with Patrick. As Roland cries the names of those who came before him, those who he were lost in the name of this quest, we see that moment from Patrick. And that's an interesting choice, right? Uh -huh. Like we're not with Roland in these final moments as he walks into the tower. We, we we divorce ourselves from that we leave he leaves us behind almost like the, this chapter starts with us ahead of roland watching as he approaches us and the chapter ends with roland walking away from us towards his tower we stay with patrick i i love that choice i love it so much uh-huh yeah yeah me too um yeah not much to add there i i i i love it as well um it feels right for some reason like mm -hmm. like it it, it we 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 we're, we're leaving we're leaving roland here i guess mm -hmm. um yeah he's going someplace that no one can no one else can follow him right um unless right. unless we demand it. we demand it right and and of course he he as he's walking towards the tower from patrick's point of view we're hearing him cry out the names of everyone right like everyone from his past uh his previous quartet and of course we get down to to the newest members of his content. I come in the name of Stephen King, he of Maine. I come in the name of Oi the Brave, he of Midworld. I come in the name of Eddie Dean, he of New York. Susanna Dean, she of New York. Jake Chambers, he of New York, whom I call my own true son. Just kind of mean to Eddie. He called you dad too. Just yeah. Rude. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. I don't want to take this is a this is a very powerful moment. Yeah. I am Roland of Gilead, and I come as myself you will open to me. After that came the sound of a horn. It simultaneously chilled Patrick's blood and exalted him. The echoes faded into silence. Then, perhaps a minute later, came a great echoing boom. The sound of a door swinging shut forever. And after that came silence. So, of course, we have the horn here. Like, if, if you read Child Roland to the Dark Tower came, there is a horn. Uh, one of the things that Roland promised in, in his first visions that he would get to the tower and he would blow his horn. But Roland doesn't have a horn here. So right. we don't know where this horn sound comes from. Yeah, that, that was that, that, that is a very interesting little little mystery. The, the horn definitely stood out to me of like, oh, mm -hmm. it's like a magic tower horn that's in the <laughs> tower or something. Yeah. Like, like, it's definitely an element where you're like a horn did not think there would be a horn okay because yeah because mm -hmm. you're right roland doesn't have doesn't have a horn never has had a horn so yep so roland enters the tower and we're here at the end of the chapter just with patrick he picks up roland's watch and just heads on back down the road back down to the federal station and i love this ending here i love this choice of patrick i can tell you no more not whether he made it back to the Federal, not whether he found stuttering Bill that was, not whether he eventually came once more to America side. I can tell you none of these things, say sorry. Here the darkness hides him from my storyteller's eye, and he must go on alone. Oh, uh, I love that. I mean, I keep saying that, but I, I, I love that so much. I, I, yet again, you know, kind of like he was at the beginning of the um, this week's reading, he's breaking the fourth wall and he's kind of messing with us too. He's, he's setting us up to be messed with a lot harder in a minute. You know, he, mm -hmm. he's, he's basically, you know, totally, you know, looking us in the eye and saying, what happens to Patrick? Good question. I don't know. And you're like, 
but but you're the but you're the writer like yeah and uh, but that's he's he's kind of been denying that you know the, the whole time he's been denying that he really has this like godlike control over the story yeah um, I, I love the choice of the darkness hides him from my storyteller's eye um mm-hmm. That's an interesting choice there, right? To use the darkness, um, not a not a positive connotation. Darkness normally is right. So, True. like, I I am there. There is something clouding my vision of what happens to this kid. Yeah, and the uh, and maybe there's a reason. For maybe that. maybe maybe you are you hinting at something, Scott? No, I can't tell. No. Okay. All right. All right. So that's the end of the book. Let's move on to our epilogue. Our right. beautiful, wonderful epilogue. So our epilogue is titled Susanna in New York. Um, before we get into this chapter, you turn the page, or in this case, the audiobook switches the track, and it says epilogue, Susanna in New York. And I just want to get, at that point, what were you thinking? Um, I mean, I was I was worried. Like, I did not think, I, I did not at all think that she was going to immediately run into actual Eddie and Jake. Okay. Like I thought, I thought that would just, that would be too, like, honestly, my thought process was like, that would be too pat. Like the dreams are not literally promising literal Eddie and Jake will be waiting for you. If you, if you, if you cry off the tower, that would be too, that would be too much. That would be too um, sweet and, and, and perfect of an ending for a series like the dark tower. But of course that is what happens. And then of course it doesn't feel pat or, or over the top at all. It feels very, earned and beautiful and 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 just just perfect so Mm -hmm. um i think that that's one reason why king is always able to surprise you is that he he can do things that you just would not guess would work but he he executes so well that they do yeah and i mean I, i think this epilogue is actually so important because i think it is really important that we get to see that everything you think this wouldn't be is exactly what it is it is happiness it is reward it is you know if we want to call it heaven like it is mm-hmm. a, a version of a, a life after the story for Susanna that gives her everything she ever wanted um and, and and I think it is important to make the distinction that Susanna chose to leave and got rewarded with everything everything uh-huh yeah that is uh important so we arrive with Susanna in New York city. It's Christmas time. Just like in her dreams, just like in her dreams, the Harlem school choir is singing. What child is this? It's this wonderful picturesque image, a happy image, everything she thought it could be. And then to top it all off, she sees Eddie. And I love this moment of fear she has here. What if he doesn't recognize her? What if when he turns around, he sees nothing but a homeless black lady in an electric cart whose battery will soon be as flat as sat as a sat on hat, a black lady with no money, no clothes, no address, and no legs, a homeless black lady with no connection to him? Or what if he does know her somewhere far back in his mind, yet still denies her as completely as Peter denied Jesus because remembering is just too hurtful? Or still, what if he turns to her and she sees the burned out, fucked up, empty eyed stare of the long time junkie? What if, what if, and here comes the snow that will soon turn their whole world white? stop thy grizzling and go to him roland tells her you didn't face blaine and the tahin of blue heaven and the thing under castle discordia just to turn tail and run now did you surely you've got a moit more guts than that um this Uh, is just wonderful right this is roland deshane talking to her in her head um roland i mean obviously it's not roland himself right this is a this is the version of roland that as you so aptly put last week that I just absolutely loved that like love is represented in our minds as the people we love speaking to us. And, and, and Roland is here giving her the strength that she needs to, to get over her fears of what's going to happen. She's been through too much to be afraid of this moment now. And I want to say here, Matt, it's not Detta Walker that does this throughout Mm. the latter half of this book. Detta Walker has served that purpose has served the purpose of popping up and being like, like in fact, just last week, Detta Walker popped. Detta Walker popped up and said, "Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of touching your cheek. You've been through too much to be afraid of touching your cheek." But that's not Detta Walker here. In fact, throughout this epilogue, there is no Detta Walker. We don't mm-hmm. reference her at all. And I think one of our question answers in the beginning part of the show mentioned that perhaps in this epilogue, this version of Susanna is a true amalgamation of all these different 
various people in a way that they, she has never been before. Yeah. Um, this is a fully realized Susanna Dean. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's a, an argument that she did have the strength to finally go through that door um, into the unknown to, and, and to cry off the tower. And that was like having done that, she no longer needs Detta. Mm -hmm. um, she 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 proved herself. She no longer she didn't need to rely on Detta. She no longer needs to rely on Detta. But you know she still has this representation of Roland with her. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think forever. Like that's such a beautiful idea that that both Eddie and Jake are here, and well, Roland is sort of with her, and and you know it, it says that the, you know the the, mem the memories fade, but. I do wonder, you know, that there, there will be that part of her that is, you know, the voice of Roland that, that will be I, with her. Um, I think so. I think so. Because I think so much of the story is what you learn from the people that you surround yourself with, mm -hmm. the, the people in your life that teach you and change you and, and the parts of them you take with you into whatever comes next. Um, and I think, yes, the memories of her time in Midworld are going to fade, but the ways in which Roland Deschain changed Susanna will remain um mm -hmm. which is again i think an important thing to establish here in the epilogue for reasons that we may or may not get into in a moment mm -hmm. right and as if to confirm the fact that that susanna dean has left her gun slinging behind as she approaches eddie she gets rid of roland's revolver that she had accidentally taken with her she tosses Roland's revolver into this litter barrel, doing it hurts her heart, but she never hesitates. It's heavy and sinks into the crumpled fast food wrappers, advertising circulars, and discarded newspapers like a stone into water. She is still enough of a gunslinger to bitterly regret throwing away such a storied weapon, even if the final trip between worlds has spoiled it. But she's already become enough of the woman who's waiting for her up ahead not to pause or look back once the job is done. This is such an important moment matt ah yeah it's great throws it in the fucking trash can it's mm -hmm. amazing it's such a statement on what this story is really about what this story is really doing right mm -hmm. king is saying the badass gunslinger woman with all these great moments where she stood up to monsters and and did amazing you know amazing feats of violence in the end she throws this ancient weapon of, of legend in the garbage and and I love it. And like it, that is a gunslinger move to just decisively and truly from the heart, throw the weapon away. Mm -hmm. This is not who I am anymore. You know, JFK is a gunslinger. He never shot anybody. She's still going to be a gunslinger. She's just not going to be a gunslinger who uses guns. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think we, we tend to attach the significance of the gun to gunslinging, but I think you're absolutely right. Like, especially when it comes to Susanna, she was established. The character was established via a conversation about jfk being the last gunslinger mm -hmm. um who yeah you're right is not a guy who was strapped pulling out his gun and shooting people every <laughs> yeah, time they crossed yeah. him like that's just not the, the person he was he, um he did not wear a docker's clutch no no so i think you're right i think that is that is Susanna growing to recognize that gunslinging being a gunslinger means more than being really good at shooting a gun and i think it is a part that roland has never learned Mm -hmm. um, even if he is good at those other parts of being a gunslinger but gunslinging is so attached to him to the to the way of the gun the the moments where he feels like the only time he's alive is when he's got the gun in his hand killing and Susanna rejects yeah. that you know it's interesting I, I don't think we've ever really been in Roland's head when he was doing his smooth talking you know JFK version of the gunslinger where you know where, mm -hmm. where he's sweet talking people where he's being a politician where he's being a leader where he's doing where he's being ceremonial um it feels like we've almost never been in his head during those times it, it's when we're in his head is when he's you know violence focused or tower focused or going to sacrifice somebody he loves imminently um and and yeah, it's just it's just interesting. We always get to see those moments, those the, the good moments of Roland. We tend to see from a third person perspective outside of him. Yeah, yeah, I think that is a choice. Absolutely, I really I want to think about that and really dissect that because yeah, sure, I think you're I think you're right that we've never really been in his head during those moments. I, I'm sure there's got to be one or two in there somewhere, but I, there's none are coming to me right now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So then, at last, Eddie sees Susanna. He doesn't know her, 
but he has been dreaming about her and he did know that she would come. Um, this is really beautiful here. His touch is electric and she sees that he feels it too. It occurs to her that he is going to kiss her again for the first time and sleep with her again for the first time and fall in love with her again for the first time. He may know these things because voices have told him, but she knows them for a far better reason because those things have already happened. Ka is a wheel, Roland said, and now she knows it's true. Her memories of the gunslinger's wear and win are growing hazy, but she thinks she will remember just enough to know that it's all happened before, and there is something incredibly sad about this. But at the same time, it's good. I I love that all that's beautifully written, and I just, I love the, you know, it's <laughs> Susanna at the end being of two minds about this this thing is I think just perfect for her that she also, she like, she loves the fact that she's going to get to experience all this again, but also the fact that it's happened before is sad to her, <laughs> that it, it is sad to be replaying things over and over again, to be to, for, yeah. for Ka to, to wheel you back. It is incredibly sad that that happens. Yeah. Well, and, and she, it's it, on, on some level, on some deep level, she knows that Eddie died and Jake died and, mm -hmm. And, uh, and in some sense, those things did happen. Those, those people are dead. And these, you know, this Eddie and Jake are not they're, quite they're those not people. They're not the same. Yeah. They're not yeah. the same people. They're yeah. close. They're, they're close. And, and this is something I wanted to talk about kind of as we wrap up the epilogue actually, but like, like it, it is sad. It, this, this doesn't, um, what she finds is not like through the door. It's like, oh, it's, it's just literally Eddie and Jake with with their 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 brains transplanted into into new bodies. No, th these are alternate dimension Eddie and Jake that kind of have those those weird double memories, like the way Jake did, which is a mm -hmm. thing that was established for us previously in the story, right? We the, the whole the whole the whole bit where Jake had his life running on two different tracks, and he you know he it was it was driving him crazy, um, which is really interesting because it reminds us that the jake that we have known in this story is not actually the same person as the guy who roland dropped <laughs> yeah because <laughs> that guy's dead um but uh and and that that is still sad right? it's still sad that, that that happened um so it's it's a uh, there's a bitter sweetness to it but i think the sweet overwhelms the bitter here because you do have this hope that um that they will be happy together even if things aren't you know even if there was this loss they still have the chance to be happy together yeah and i mean it's a version of eddie that has not had his his overbearing and incredibly awful older mm -hmm. brother like pushing down on him the whole time yeah it's a version of jake that has eddie dean as his older brother eddie was always i think i think it's jane pair jane that said this in our discussion question this week eddie has always been like better at being the older brother than he was at being the younger brother because mm -hmm. he was just he's just good at it and he gets to do that with jake so it's a version of these characters that have lived a better life than yeah. the versions we saw and there is something sweet and and nice about that I, I i love it i love that like i love this moment where eddie says hey wait if you're gonna hang out with me i gotta introduce you to my brother and Susanna and us were like, oh, fuck, not Henry, not Henry yeah. fucking Dean. But no, it's his kid brother. It's Jake. We learned that they're Eddie and Jake Torin, which is perfect. Uh -huh. um, yeah, this this is we get we're told specifically this is a different world, right? Like Gary Hart is president of the United States. This is Takuro Spirits uh, and uh, uh -huh. and Nazo Lacola is here. This is a different world. This is a world that none of them, none of our characters have been to before. But yeah. No, this is but the world of the stand, but the virus hasn't happened yet. No, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, sorry, I'm so sorry. Um, uh, I will say, I, si sitting here right now, I just realized, I just realized what the fuck the authors of of uh, Lost were trying to do with the ending of this show. Yeah, man, and they did a good job at it. Shut up, you're wrong. Okay. They did a good job. The end of that show is good. I'm tired of arguing with people about that show. It's great. Okay, but you know what? It makes a lot more sense to me now that I have this as a frame of reference. Okay. But before I had this as a frame of reference, it did not. So, you know, just saying, man. <laughs> if if you have if you have the idea of there being multiple dimensions that people can go between and then kind of kind of kind of have their memories but not 
but they're not quite the same people, but they kind of are. Well, then this, then the ending of Lost might make more sense. Are you saying it's finally start time to start our Lost rewatch podcast? Is um, that what you're saying? That's not what I'm. That's man of science, man of faith, the best name for a Lost rewatch podcast ever, and I've had this name for three years, and you haven't let me do it, you jerk. I I just. I, it's so good. I've, I've I've given you the dark tower, Scott. <laughs> I will take my dark tower and I will take everything else, Matt. I will just stop. Keep taking and taking. Your eyes are fixed. <laughs> your eyes are fixed on your tower and you'll exactly. drop as many podcast co-hosts into the, into the crevasse as you need to, to get there. Exactly. Now um, you understand. At last you understand. Yeah. Well, well now that we're here at the end, I guess I do. Um, um, okay. So let's, let's, read these last bits of this chapter and we can talk about the epilogue as a whole. So here's how the epilogue ends. And will I tell you that these three live happily ever after? I will not for no one ever does, but there was happiness and they did live beneath the flowing and sometimes glimpsed glamor of the beam that connects Shardik and the bear, the bear and Matron, the turtle by the way of the dark tower. They did live. That's all. That's enough. Say thank you. It's, uh beautiful mm -hmm. it, it's perfect <laughs> it's everything that you would want like th th it is designed happiness it is designed a, a gift it, like i think that it, the text specifically states ka is on her side now and mm -hmm. ka is giving her this gift and and why is ka giving her this gift because she cried off because right. she said no i don't want that no i choose love instead of the tower Yes, it it's it's like um, on some level you're like this is too good to be true, but mm -hmm. I think I think that thematically it's perfectly correct, and that's what actually matters. She made the right choice, and so Ka rewards her as fully as Ka can manage without breaking its own rules. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and and uh, kind of like we were talking on on the Misery podcast the other night, um, Ka can't just literally bring them back to life but ka has established that it can kind of bring them back to life mm -hmm. so it does that there and, there are infinite worlds with infinite people and so yeah. let's just deliver susanna to a world in which she gets everything she wanted yeah yeah i mean the, the intellectual part of me um you know is like is this really eddie is this really jake is this <laughs> is this really a happy ending or is this like a secretly a a, a you know a sad ending because she's kind of deluding herself. Um, and, and, and frankly, that intellectual part of me, uh, which it just kind of strikes me as dull and nitpicky at this point. Cause it's like, <laughs> it's like, y yes, it's close enough. Don't worry about it. They, they get a chance at happiness and you know, it, it's, it's, it's great. It's great. I, I yeah. love it actually. Yeah. I mean like the, and the honest truth is that like, Henry or Eddie and Jake like exist in this world regardless of whether Susanna gets to come here. So yeah. they're already going to be just like doing their thing and living their best version of their life when they don't have, they, the two of them don't have this traumatic life that they have been forced to live. Um, that was, we can say prepping them for this quest of the tower. The gift here is that Susanna gets to live in this world in which yeah. these, these two men are the best versions of themselves. These, these, these two men and, and, you know, uh, uh, a, a kind of weird looking dog is going to join them yeah. later on. Right. Some sort of weird looking golden eyed dog. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and they get to, I mean, basically they get to be a Cotet again because Cotet is family. And yep. I mean, this, this kind of feathers in, I think to the idea that Roland maybe really indeed never was as, as fully part of, of their Cotet as they yeah. are amongst themselves because they were maybe sort of destined to be a family that went on and, 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 you know, was together. Yeah. Um, but is he, <laughs> is he not a part of that family because he could not be, or because he would not allow himself to he, be? He chose like, not to be. Yeah. From the, from the very beginning, like I, I love looking back on it. Now you look back on the course of the book and from the very beginning, Roland's like, yeah, but y'all are closer. Cause you're from the same place and I'm not. Um, and it's, that's really funny because we learned that they're all like, they're not just from different winds. They're from like different versions. Like there's yeah, for forever, like infinite versions of earth. And right. there, there's no guarantee that they're from the same ones. 
so like this idea that you're from the same place, so you're all close and I'm always going to be a little bit separate from you is I think just his fear coming forward. And, and he, he, he makes it true through his own insistence that it is true. Yeah. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy and the yes. fact that he, he doesn't feel lovable. I think, I mean, I think the perfect image, um, just prior to, to Eddie dying was like, him looking at them all hugging with this incredible expression of longing on his face and and Susanna being like basically like hey idiot get over here <laughs> yeah like like why are you standing over there you know mm -hmm. like like mm -hmm. like you're you're a part of this you're willingly you're willingly standing over there staring us staring at us with longing instead of just joining us and that's that's who he is that's the, the choice that he makes over and over and over so yep yep and that is the end of the epilogue. So Susanna gets to live not happily ever after, but happily. Yep. All right. It's time to move on to our coda, Matt. It's time to move on to found the name of our coda. And we begin this not with Roland, but with our wordslinger himself. It's Cy Stephen King. And he is here to tell us that he's done. He's done telling his story. He doesn't need to tell it anymore. And he will go on only if we demand it. He says, you say you want to know how it all comes out. You say you want to follow Roland into that tower. You say that is what you paid your money for. The show you came to see. I hope most of you know better. Want better. I hope you came to hear the tale and not just munch your way through the pages to the ending. And so, my dear constant reader, I tell you this. You can stop here. You can let your last memory be of seeing Eddie, Susanna, and Jake in Central Park together again for the first time, listening to the children's choir sing What Child Is This? You can be content in the knowledge that sooner or later, boy, probably a canine version with a long neck, odd gold-ringed eyes, and a bark that sometimes sounds eerily like speech, will also enter the picture. That's a pretty picture, isn't it? I think so. And pretty close to happily ever after, too. Close enough for government work as Eddie would say. Should you go on, you will surely be disappointed, perhaps even heartbroken. I have one key left on my belt, but all it opens is that final door, the one marked unfound. What's behind it won't improve your love life, grow hair on your bald spot, or add five years to your natural span. Not even five minutes. There's no such thing as a happy ending. I never met a single one to equal once upon a time. Endings are heartless. Ending is just another word for goodbye. All right, Matt. So let's, uh, let's do it. Let's do what Roland could not. Let's close the book and cry off. That is it for Kingslingers this week. We'll be back next week with an overview episode as we look back on all 817 pages of The Dark Tower. We'll see you all then. Long days and pleasant nights. And may you have twice the number. Would you still? Very well then, come. Do you hear me sigh? Here is the dark tower at the end of Endworld. See it, I beg. See it very well. Here is the dark tower at sunset. So Matt, this uh, that incredible joke we just pulled aside, I want to talk to you about this choice. We'll circle back to King's Warning once we get to the very end of the very end itself. But I wanted to ask you, was there ever a moment where you considered not turning that next page, not going on, actually listening to Stephen King's warning? Was there any part of you that wanted to heed this warning, even even a little part? Yes, um, I, I considered it seriously uh, because it's obvious what King has done to us here. Um, you know that Roland should have cried off, but mm -hmm. he couldn't fundamentally because he has to know. And we want to know too, since the first book, we've wanted to see what's at the top of the tower. And, you know, can, can we deny ourselves that? Surely I'm a hypocrite on some level for insisting that Roland should cry off when I'm not willing to cry off myself. Yep. Uh, 
and and, and so I, I i i didn't want to be a hypocrite i wanted to say hey king's right i was here for the journey i don't i don't need to know how it ends um but of course um i knew we had to talk about this for the podcast thing that we're doing that you may have heard of <laughs> And, and and maybe that's an excuse, though. Like, maybe that's what I told myself. I, I think it probably is an excuse. I, I wanted to know. You know, I didn't feel like... And then Roland walked off toward the tower and he, and he cried the names of his, of his loved ones and, and then the door slammed and then there was silence. That wasn't, that wasn't like enough closure for me. I was greedy. I was greedy for more closure. That mm-hmm. wasn't the... Clo- that, like... That was a kind of closure, but it's not the closure I wanted, you know, and mm-hmm. and and so, um, you you and you kind of know whatever Roland finds in the tower, it will close that arc. Although, unfortunately, in this case, it's not an arc, but a ring. Mm-hmm. So yeah, um, and we will talk about that when we get to it. But I, I agree with you. I mean, I. I, I love to use the excuse of we're doing a podcast on this and we can't not analyze pages in the book. But at the same time, I've never talked to a person who's read the series and who just closed the book there and said, yeah, I'm good. Um, right. And, and I think King knows that, too. And that's that's part of that's part of the brilliance with what he's doing here is he's he's sitting here telling you, you don't need to go on. You don't need to do this. But I know you're going to anyway, just like I'm going to, just like Roland did. Of course, we're going to. And he knows it. And and I think it is it is like you're right that it's kind of manipulating you a little bit because we did not get closure on Roland's story. But like. The point is that Roland has already made the mistake by the time we leave him. Mm -hmm. And I think the book has made that clear. So. It, w- whether we know what what the full extent of that mistake is he's already made his choice at this point the door is closed it's all too late um he's just got to live with the consequence of it for this brief moment before he forgets what the consequence is but um the the, the choice ha- is done he he chose for, I, almost from the moment that he let Susanna go he had chosen and and there's there's a hundred choices throughout the course of this book where he could like that's why it was so important and that's why i wanted to emphasize as we talk through it every moment where someone says hey bud you don't gotta go there anymore yeah we're we're good we're golden and and those few moments where where he thinks to himself i mean basically all of them related to jake where where he he muse he either muses like i could just have a life with this kid and not worry about the tower or at least put it off for a while or when he Mm -hmm. thinks to himself I'm going to, if it comes down to one of us or the other, it's going to be me. I'm going to throw, I'm going to, I'm going to sacrifice myself so that Jake can live Mm -hmm. and, and screw the tower. And then, and then that is robbed from him. And then what else is left for him after that, other than the tower yet again. Mm -hmm. Um, But, 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 but in that moment for just a second, you know, for five minutes, he's made the right choice, but then it's not quite so easy. He can't, he can't do it provisionally. He can't do it provisionally. Okay, well, only if Jake is here, you know, or, or only if I get to die immediately, rather. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if I get to die immediately, I will not go to the tower. Um, that's not really. <laughs> that's great. That's great. Yeah. That's the only way I won't go is if I die. Yeah. yeah. Awesome, Roland. Yeah, I mean, I think what we see here is we see a character who's, who's close. He's very close mm-hmm. to learning the lesson he needs to learn, mm-hmm. but he is just not quite there yet. Um, and it's it's yeah. it's such a fascinating moment in this story to pick up, as we'll we'll talk about later. But yeah. uh, we are here with Roland now as he walks up to the tower, and the first beat we get in this chapter is this odd feeling of remembrance, this deja vu. And now King, like knowing that you have chosen to read on into this coda, is just throwing everything you need to know at you. There's been hints throughout this entire series, but he's really just laying it on thick now. Yeah. Um, you know, it reminds me of the deja vu that we got um, in the Kala, which which other characters other than him felt at the time, which made me wonder, like, do I need to do a reread and see if that's somehow related? Like, or, or I, I'm still I still am kind of like, like stuck on why certain things felt familiar to them when they were going into the Kala. Like, I don't quite feel like I get that yet. But I, I, and, and now that we have this, you know, device, I'm like, well, maybe 
it's because they're remembering that they've done this before. But I'm I'm not settled on that though. So yeah, I mean, a, a fun thing about a reread is you see little bits and pieces like that as well. Um, uh, basically, anytime Roland talks to the Man in Black, mm-hmm. uh, he's giving some hints. <laughs> it, it seems very obvious that Randall Flag is aware of the loop mm-hmm. on some level because he tends to reference it pretty directly when he talks to Roland um, in ways that never make sense to us the first time I'm reading it. And of course make zero sense to Roland. But when you look back on it, you're like, yup, yup. Um, yeah. And, and may- maybe, maybe whatever level of awareness he has is like what made him crazy and, you know, sure. completely kind of detached from reality the way he is. Mm-hmm. But, but yeah, that's, um, I, I, that's one of the things that makes me look forward to a reread for sure. Yeah. So the horn noise we saw from Patrick's point of view, of course, happens. Um, but it was not from Roland, of course, because Roland doesn't have a horn. And here's here's what we see what happens. In my dreams, the horn was always mine, he thought. I should have known better, for mine was lost with Cuthbert at Jericho Hill. A voice whispered from above him. It would have been the work of three seconds to bend and pick it up, even in the smoke and the death. Three seconds. Time, Roland. It always comes back to that. That was, he thought, the voice of the beam, the one they had saved. If it spoke out of gratitude, it could have saved its breath. For what good were such words to whom now? He remembered a line from Browning's poem, One taste of the old times sets all to rights. Such had never been his experience. In his own memories brought only sadness. They were food of poets and fools, sweets that left a bitter aftertaste in the mouth and throat. Uh huh. Well, perhaps that would not be true, Roland, if you did not constantly deprioritize <laughs> your loved ones and sometimes kill them. Yes, absolutely. Y- you know what I love about this the most? Here's what the beam is saying to him. Here's what the tower is saying to him. You should have fucking picked up the horn, Roland. Right. Like, like it would have been the work of three seconds to bend and pick it up. The horn, maybe Jake at the beginning, right? Like it would have been the work of three seconds to pick up Jake, but you decided that if you did that, there would be no time to catch the man in black. You right. made that decision. Time. It always comes back to time, Roland. And what what is Roland's reaction to that here? If it spoke out of gratitude, it could have saved its breath. What the fuck are you talking about? It's not <laughs> speaking out of gratitude here. Uh-huh. It's not saying, hey, thanks, buddy. You yeah. saved me. That's not what it's saying, it's saying to you. Yeah. It's saying you fucked up, you idiot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Like ev- everything. I mean, that's what's funny is is we're gonna see stuff as we go through the tower, and it, and it seems like even though he's already in the tower, the tower itself and the beam and the, and the voice of the tower are, st- are still saying, "Turn back. You can still turn back. You're not. <laughs> you're not actually through the door yet. You can still turn back. Like this is the most explicit warning you're going to get. This is your last goddamn warning." Yeah, um, I mean this this one right here. He still hasn't walked through the door. Okay, he's yeah, still yeah. outside the tower. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this is. I, I read this as kind of, in my opinion, I kind of agree with you. But in my opinion, I read this as both final, final, final warning, mm-hmm. as well as I know it's too late, and I'm kind of just like, I don't want to say that the beam is gloating a little bit. The tower is gloating a little bit, but I think there's a little bit of that. It's like. It would three seconds, Roland. It's it always comes back to time and your decision that you just don't have enough of it. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, and yeah. <laughs> I just I, I I just remember reading that every time I read that where he goes, if it spoke out of gratitude, it could have saved its breath. Are you are you high? <laughs> like, <laughs> listen to what it just said to you. Uh huh. Yeah. I, yeah. I guess it, his refusal to to hear. Right. Just he he needs to continue to plot ahead. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you could maybe argue that he's saying that the 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 porn noise was the voice of the beam, and it's speaking out of gratitude. But like mixed in with the the voice that's being whispered to him, it's just I don't know how you I don't know how you get that. <laughs> I don't know how you get that. Uh huh. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think I think right here we're kind of seeing presented to us the error that Roland has made, right? the Browning poem right here. One taste of the old times sets all to rights, you know, cherish the old times, cherish the memories, cherish the love. Even if those things are taken from you as they are from all of us, we will eventually lose everything that we love because our lives don't go on. But that doesn't mean 
it's not worth it. That doesn't mean you abandon it because you know it's only going to be fleeting and temporary. Um, and he doesn't get that lesson. Yeah. Yet. I, I, uh, for some reason, I'm remembering how powerful it was when we read the epilogue or, or whatever it was called, the part of the, um, the part of the book where Steve, you know, we're reading through Stephen King's journal entries Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, basically the last one is him just talking about how incredibly grateful he is to have the life that he has surrounded by family, you know, his own quartet. And, and he's just, he's just so lucky and he's so grateful for all of the luck that he has. But that's because that's, those are the choices that man, that, pseudo fictional character has made yeah and then and then he dies and it's really like it like i said at the time it really hit me hard that he died there that that, that the character died there um because it just seemed like such a a horribly sad loss but also there's a feeling of like but he had such a he he was so grateful for his life um that, that you got the sense that he he would have been he would have been fine if he died there like mm-hmm um whereas roland is the opposite like like there's a stark there's a stark contrast here where every choice that you know uh fred king has made to get to where he is in his life roland has made the opposite and mm. and thus roland is no nowhere near the same level of like peace and happiness and acceptance um yeah his fate I mean, there, there's so many reasons why I love the ending of this this story, and and we're going a little out of order here, and that's fine because we're in the coda. We can talk about whatever we want whenever we want to. I think, on the level of what the tower meant when the story started, to what it came to mean to our author as he continued to write the series, is one of the things that I love the most about this story. This is a story that he he comes right out and says he wrote the first the first bit of when he was 19 years old and a 19 year old has a much different grasp on life and what they want to accomplish and what is important to them than a 40 something 50 something year old man right and this idea this idea of you know we've called the tower a metaphor for addiction and i think it is absolutely that 100% the tower is also this 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 goal this 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 idealized version of what your life could be and what your life could mean and i love that stephen king a man who has has accomplished a great many things in his life um looks at a moment of his death of of he almost died if i you think i i read on writing again this weekend and he says in in the moment that he was told at the last minute he kind of broke to the left slightly. And if he hadn't broke to the left in the millisecond before the van hit him, that it would have hit him in a way that he probably would have died. Mm-hmm. And so like he was so close to death. And so he, he, he survives through this thing and he looks at this, this story that he had been, that had d- d- defined not only his career, but his life and he decides to make the story about, hey, maybe you don't need to go to that tower. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like maybe you don't need to be grasping for the unreachable thing. Maybe you need to look around and recognize the things that you have in your life, the things that truly bring you happiness. Stop and smell the roses. Yes, say. exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, and and I think I can tell you now that um, King has said publicly that the rose, the the rose in the vacant lot, in his mind, was a symbol of his wife, uh-huh. um, of Tabitha King. And I think that's that's a very powerful image there too, right? That these things are connected, but but that is something that Roland can't do like he yeah. he learned to love again and that's great like it's great that you learn to love again it's wonderful i'm so happy for you roland but you also still still chose to abandon that love for that thing that 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 immeasurable unconquerable thing mm-hmm. 
in the distance. Yeah. And that, that King has kind of come to a place in his life where he says, you know, I want to make the story about how you don't need to do that. Yeah. Do, that, 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 that's not necessary. Yeah. Well, it, I, I, yeah. I love it. It's, it's a self-destructive choice. And as, as we always say, the, the, the best of genre fiction is when it's really just a, a, a pretty clean metaphor for something real where all you do when you give in to your, your, your personal tower, your personal addiction is you perpetuate a cycle. Um, mm -hmm. You're not literally going to time travel, but you are just starting that cycle all over again every time you make that choice. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, all right, let's uh, let's get into some more of this because we're kind of jumping ahead a bit yeah. here. Um, so Roland walks up to the door of the tower. The symbol unfound appears on it and then changes to found and the door swings open. Roland enters the tower. Each floor is 19 steps above the next and each floor has a bit of Roland's memory from it, an item and a smell and some pictures. Uh, the first door we see a the, an umbilical cord clip and he gets this alkali smell. Um, it, it's a really powerful choice. Like it's kind of like, Roland, this is your life, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, the alcohol, the, uh, the, the alcohol, yeah, that's a Freudian slip there. Um, the, <laughs> the, the, the alkali smell is is just, you might remember what that means, but you probably won't, you know? I, I, mm -hmm. I just love that. I love, love that detail. The, the focus on the smells here throughout the tower is really amazing. Like for, for whatever reason, smells just kind of really teleport you. And me, me at least, they teleported me into this scene in a way that I don't usually experience with writing. Yeah. And I mean, within, um, within the story itself, like smells are so powerfully tied to memory, right? Like that's mm -hmm. just how our brains work. Like smells tied to memory in a way that other things don't. And so it's all part of forcing Roland to relive his past in these moments as he walks up these steps. Yeah. And, and it, uh, it uh, you're absolutely right. I, I guess for me, it just, it makes it more vivid. Um, it makes it more vivid to me. Um, sure. Because I, I, I was not there on Jericho Hill, but I kind of conjure up the smell of gunpowder or whatever. And then I'm sure. And then I suddenly am kind of more there, even though I was never really there, you know? Sure. So. Sure. I really like this part because when he gets to the second floor, Roland finds a bit of swaddling clout. This is uh we kind of guess that he, he wore this as a, an infant as it's kind of going through his life. It's really interesting here, though, because this is the level at which the Crimson King had invaded the tower. And we kind of assume here because he sees the clout in in sh like shredded in, in little bits. He ripped it apart as he made his way out to the balcony where he found himself stuck forever, mm -hmm. which which means that the items were placed in the tower for Roland before he entered. It's not like the door opened and the tower goes, OK, formatting for Roland to Shane uh, generate items generate right. smells you know like it was just this is roland's tower right mm -hmm. this is it always was roland's tower regardless of who enters it yeah. i think that's a fascinating choice yeah it's been here the whole time mm -hmm. i love that uh roland sees the collar of his dog ringo um and we this is where i, I was talking about earlier where um he uh, this this really tragic thing where it says like he was lucky that the dog died when he was three because he was still allowed to cry for a lost dog um, at three years old. He was still young enough to get to cry for a lost dog. And that's just like, uh, this society is fucked up. Like yeah. <laughs> my, my wife and I lost a dog last year and we both were devastated. Yeah. And I'm, I'm a, I'm a full grown man. Yeah. Um, it's okay to cry for your lost dogs. Dogs are great. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I mean, he's, he's cried very little for all of the, all of the, you know, the sons he's lost in the story. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, just shows you, yeah, he's the fact that he was able to cry at all. You could say is a sign of growth actually. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, then we, he sees David, his first of many sacrifices for the tower. And we get to this part, not far from court was the laughing face of the whore with whom the boy had sported the nat night. The smell in David's room was her perfume, cheap and sweet. As the gunslinger drew it in, he remembered touching the whore's pubic curls and was shocked to remember now what he had remembered then. As his fingers slid towards her sick, slicky, sweet cleft, be, being fresh out of his baby's bath with his mother's hands upon him, he began to grow hard, and Roland fled that room in fear. So once again here at the very end is Roland's Oedipal nature rising up once again. Stephen King has hit this beat so many times 
that you're just like, geez, Roland, you got some mommy issues here. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love the fact that the moment when he he's confronted with this memory, he flees in fear. It's like mm-hmm. fear fear of recognizing your your issues, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and you know, I don't know what to do with this. Like you're, you're right that it's come up over and over. I don't know what function it serves. I mean, I, I, I just tried to think today, does Roland map onto the Oedipus legend in other ways that I haven't thought of? I'm like, well, he, he doesn't kill his father and marry his mother, but he, he does kill his mother, but it's not like it, it, he's, I don't feel like it's, it's a very, strong you know that the, there's a sphinx in there kind of like like you if you squint you can kind of see some oedipus rex references but it's not it's not overwhelming and i just anyway i guess i'm just saying i don't really know what this element of of roland um being hot for his mom is 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 serving in the story yeah i mean to me it shows a lack of growth i mean i think like freud would say and and we kind of know now that freud was not entirely accurate in the things he said but freud would say that like this is a thing that children have right that young boys have this weird attraction to their mother that they don't understand and most people grow out of it um roland hasn't and i think it's it's wrapped up in the complicated nature he has with his mother and father and this this the fact that he killed his mother and the guilt he feels over that it's wrapped up in this complicated thing so to me this is showing here at the end of the story he has not come to terms with his mom and he's still having this weird attraction to her that that scares him he's not dealing with it he's not facing it he's just fleeing from it he hasn't he's changed in many ways this is still something he hasn't truly faced um and i i think i think that to me that's what it was so i'm I'm not i'm not looking for a direct oedipus rex comparison here but just like the freudian the freudian psychology of of this weird uh maternal attraction yeah i like the idea that he's in a state of arrested development because he's literally in a state of arrested development that's the whole point (laughs) yes Um, yes. and, and also we know that we know that king is thinking in pseudo Freudian terms, because he introduced us to Tweedle D, Tweedle Die, and Tweedle No, uh, Femolo, Femolo, Fumolo, um, which mm-hmm. were explicitly Freudian analogs. Um, uh, right. So, so you're you're right that when he when he he's probably doing less of a literary reference to Oedipus and more of a psych psychology reference to Oedipus here. I, I yeah. think you're I think you're onto something there. Yeah, yeah. Totally. Um, I also like this part where he says, I'm like one of the old people's robots, he thought. One that will either accomplish the task for which it has been made or beat itself to death trying. <laughs> so close, Roland. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. close. So, so close to getting it. <laughs> uh, come on, old buddy. Yeah. Just 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 stop for a second and think about that. Yeah, I mean, it, it's so fitting in a in a a book and a series in which these robots, these, just these plotting robots continuing on with their tasks well beyond their usefulness have slowly been driven insane by that central fact. And then yeah. we have Roland who's like, I'm just like those and not thinking about it <laughs> beyond that at all. Uh-huh. Yep. Uh, eventually Roland gets to Magus and Susan, he relives her death. And then he says, this is a place of death. He thought, and not just here, all these rooms, every floor, Yes, gunslinger, whispered the voice of the tower, but only because your life has made it so. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yet again, I, I had the sense that maybe this is a warning. Maybe this is the tower saying you can still turn back. The tower itself is telling you you can still turn back. On the other hand, maybe, maybe not. Maybe it's like, yeah, it's just, it's just kind of like disappointed in him. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that was my read. It's just like this here we go again (laughs) and it's just disappointed it's just filled with disappointment i I think you're probably right because the roland that chooses to open the door at the bottom of the tower is the roland that chooses to open the door at the top of the tower Mm -hmm. regardless um yeah so well i mean i think the book made it clear that when that when that door at the bottom of the tower shuts it shuts forever like there's no there's no turning back from that point Mm mm-hmm Uh, So Roland climbs and climbs and climbs 200 stories all of his life 
And for a while, he convinces himself that there must be no end. There couldn't be an end. But then he's like, wait a minute, this is a story of my life and all lives end. So there must be an end to this tower, which is hilarious. Uh (laughs) Finally, as Roland gets to the top, the tower shrinks around him. The final passage that he walks up is no wider than the sides of a coffin. Stephen King is not subtle. (laughs) Uh (laughs) His, His imagery is not subtle at all. It is very clear here. Yeah. Um, and, and by this point, the sides of a coffin, you're like, oh, you know, this is going to be bad. This is going to be real bad, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Oh, man. And, and like you're, you're like, oh, I don't know what it's going to be, but this is not going to be a happy ending. I mean, he's told us as much, but yeah. Uh, yeah. God. Um, you know, j- this is just like a, a tangent thought that popped in my head. But like, like, yes, this is his tower. But what if what if everyone who approaches the tower finds their own tower? You know, because the tower is this axis of the universe. It's it, it encompasses all universes. What if, mm-hmm. you know, if Eddie Dean had been the one to approach the tower, he would have found, you know, uh, Henry Dean uh, uh, syringes and stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, that's that's the really interesting thing to me about the choice mm-hmm. to, to make it very clear that the, the swaddling cloth mm-hmm. on that second floor has been ripped to shreds as by, if, by the Crimson King, by the Crimson yeah. King. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Good point. Um, Good point. So I. I I, I don't know. I mean, I, I I think this is because this is Roland's story. This is Roland's tower. This mm-hmm. is Roland's loop. Because of that, this is Roland's tower. And if if there is a version of the world in which Eddie Dean gets to a a version of the tower, perhaps. But that's not yeah. this story. Yeah. I mean, the, the only I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go into too much of a tangent here. I was just, I was just like thinking like, what if sometimes the man in black does succeed. But every time he gets to the tower, he's he's incapable of growth. It just makes him worse. Um, and that's why yeah. he's 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 as bad as he is. Um, well, yeah, I mean, we we were told that if the Crimson King gets to the top, the world will end because he'll get the power of God and be able to rip the tower down. How does that square with what we know lies at the top of this tower? Right. Uh, I'm not sure. Right. Um, yeah. And And the truth may be that just that was never going to happen. There was mm-hmm. never a threat of that happening ever yeah yeah Um, ka would not have allowed that yeah 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 so he gets to the top and at the top he sees of course another magic door matt it was always going to be a magic door Mm -hmm. this one says roland and here we go roland opened the door at the top of the dark tower He saw and understood at once the knowledge falling upon him in a hammer blow, hot as the sun of the desert that was the apotheosis of all deserts. How many times had he climbed these stairs only to find himself peeled back, curved back, turned back? Not to the beginning, when things might have been changed and time's curse lifted, but to that moment in the Mohane Desert when he had finally understood that his thoughtless, questionless quest would ultimately succeed. How many times have he tra- has he traveled a loop like this one in the clip that had once pinched off his navel, his own Tetka Kagan? How many times would he travel it? Oh no, he screamed, please not again, have pity, have mercy. The hands pulled him forward regardless. The hands of the tower know no mercy. They were the hands of Gan, the hands of Ka, and they knew no mercy. Ah. <laughs> But not for you, gunslinger, never for you, you darkle, you tinked. May I be brutally frank? You go on. <laughs> uh yep. He knew, he knew. Um so, yeah, but I mean, this is so <laughs> let's talk about that ageless stranger again, right? Uh-huh. Because Roland was told before he faces the Crimson King, before he wins, before he accomplishes everything, his objective, he must face the ageless stranger um that's him yeah that's you darkle you tinked the ageless stranger darkles you tinked who is roland but not an ageless stranger that he doesn't remember right because he doesn't remember roland has no age because he's been living this loop over and over and over again um he's a stranger because he forgets it every time is he not the ageless stranger and therefore must he face himself must he overcome his worst tendencies before he can win the day yeah he, he's clearly ageless he's explicitly ageless in the sense that he's like a even in this timeline ageless <laughs> yep uh setting aside the time looping 
Um, yeah, I, th- I, I think you're right. Um, <laughs> that makes way more sense than the ageless stranger being, you know, uh, uh, Patrick or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I'm trying to, yeah, I, 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 it's one of those things where I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna really feel sure until I have reread it actually. Um, I also feel like the darkle and pink thing just like has to be a reference to something, but I don't know what. So I looked it up and I wasn't able to find anything. I don't know if this is just like, I, I don't think it's a, a Robert Browning reference. I don't know. I'll, I'll do some research yeah. and maybe we can talk about it again next week. The one thing that jumped in my mind is um, one thing the man in black did say to him. I'm going to get the wording wrong because it was in the first book, but it's like, you're going to, you know, open that final door at the top of the tower. And, you know, will you, what face will you see across the candle flame or, or whatever, it's something like that. And it's like, well, it's his own face. Basically he's the door, the door leads on to Roland. It's, it's the, it's the Roland door. It's for Roland and it leads to Roland. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a mirror basically. Yep. Yep. Um, which is a very fairy tale sort of thing to be, you know, the, the secret answer, answer to the riddle is that it's a mirror is that it's actually you um it was you yeah. the whole time um okay so matt we got I, I i need your reaction to this ending but i i want us to get through it to the end first and okay. then we can talk about if you if you liked the choice that was made here or not okay so we're back in roland and we're back in the version of roland we saw way back in the gunslinger already forgetting his previous quest sways a bit um he i think i think the 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 gunslinger opens with him talking about this odd yawing sensation, um, which we understand where where that comes from now. Uh, but here he hasn't quite forgotten, and he's still hearing voices in his head. And and look at these voices kind of laying out the theme for us. Uh-huh. You're the one who never changes, Court had told him once. And in his voice, Roland could have sworn he heard fear. Although why Court should have been afraid of him, a boy, Roland couldn't tell. It'll be your damnation, boy. You'll wear out a hundred pair of boots on your walk to hell. And Venet, those who do not learn from their past are condemned to repeat it. And his mother, Roland, must you always be so serious? Can you never rest? Yet the voice whispered it again. Different this time, mayhap different. And Roland did seem to smell something other than the al- alkali and devil grass. He thought it might be flowers. He thought it might be roses. So again, unsettled Stephen King kind of telling us here, this is it. This is, he needs to learn. Mm-hmm. He's in his own Groundhog Day, and it's just a very long Groundhog Day, mm-hmm. and he needs to learn, and he hasn't learned. But, but there's something else. Something has changed. Uh He has his horn. In this version, in this loop, he took those three seconds to pick it up from the corpse of his old friend. And the text tells us, this is your sigil, whispered the fading voice that bore with it the dusk sweet scent of roses, this scent of home on a summer evening. Oh, lost, a stone, a rose, an unfound door, a stone, a rose, a door. This is your promise that things may be different, Roland, that there may yet be rest. Even salvation, a pause, and then, if you stand, if you are true. So Roland touches his horn for strength and walks on. And then as we started, the man in black fled across the desert and the gunslinger followed. Oh my God. The, as, as we were approaching the, the, the last sentence, I was like, oh my God, he's going to end it with that sentence, isn't he? And then <laughs> he so did. so perfect. And I was like, ah. Oh. All right, Matt, lots to talk about here. We got to talk about the horn. We got to talk about why the horn could mean something different. But first and foremost, I want to get your reaction to this. What was your reaction to this ending? Because, you know, as I've stated with with my father, I think you maybe understand why now um, my father got so angry. Some people some people were, as King even tells you, disappointed in what happened here. I I mean, I think this is a... uh choice of of staggering genius I, i'm <laughs> like but i mean i don't think anyone should be surprised that i think that because i've been saying for quite a long time like my reading of this story has been roland's not supposed to go to the tower the lesson we're supposed to learn is he's he's on the wrong quest like this isn't a grail quest this is a this is a quest to for, for hell like mm-hmm. it's 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 a it's this it's self destructive it's destructive to everyone around him. He needs like my prediction 
was going to be he's going to choose to cry off for the sake of one of his loved ones and fundamental like, like in an important sense i'm right actually because that's the only way that he can possibly be free it yeah. just so happens that the, this the, the the story is not the last cycle the story is he he didn't learn his lesson he doesn't learn his lesson this is not the story of of a man who learned that lesson um but maybe yeah. he can he, maybe he still can and and we're left with that hope um yeah i mean it is it is it is an ending that certainly leaves you sad in a lot of ways like Roland, like in this moment, begging, please show mercy, have mercy on me. This is a man who we emphasized in the last couple of weeks is so tired, so exhausted, is so heartbroken and just wants to be done. And and the the cruel punishment is that he will never be done. He cannot be done until he learns. But I think one of the things that is hopeful to me is that like in real life, we don't get these chances right we don't get these opportunities in our life to go oh fuck we fucked up we made the wrong choice let's fix it we don't get that choice roland is being given it's a curse absolutely it's a curse but it's also a gift in many ways because he has a chance to fix it yeah if he can just learn if he can just stand if he can just be true and you get the sense that there's some residue of these experiences that remains yeah. Um, he doesn't remember, but the horn is a kind of symbol of the idea that all of this stuff that happened, it's its not completely erased. It's mm-hmm. its somewhere in his soul. And and so things have a chance to be different. And may, maybe all maybe it's just the difference of he takes that extra three seconds to to grab Jake's hand and keep him from falling. And then the entire story is different, right? Yeah. Like, like God, how, how different would the story be if he just made that choice? And, and then the man in black gets away, but... Ka's not going to let him off the hook that easily. So, right. So, yeah. So like, like it's a sad, it's, I'm going to be honest. Like I didn't feel sad. I didn't feel unsatisfied. I felt like, I, I don't know if like euphoric is the right word, but like, like, first of all, just kind of in awe of the genius of, of doing it this way and, and having mm-hmm. it be, having the theme just land so incredibly hard i mean to god talk about sticking the landing um yeah. um but but also the idea that like well there is still hope for this guy maybe you know maybe maybe he'll be freed on the next cycle maybe he'll make the right choice this time around and we can hope for that maybe maybe it won't be the next cycle enough to keep suffering and suffering and um you know I, I hate to think that eddie and Susanna and jake will be suffering along with him but maybe they won't right like like maybe he draws different people depending yeah. on what he needs to learn um in turn you know you know like w- 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 what he's missing right because i i like to think that the part of him that needed to be healed is maybe a little bit more healed now mm-hmm. um i like to think and, that and and king doesn't tell us not to think that and so i, I figured that's okay you know yeah i mean we, we've talked about how king is is very not very subtle with some of his themes and and to to great effect in my opinion but what i love about this ending and i totally agree with you this is this is a staggering work of genius in my opinion and it is an ending that feels instantly as if there was no other way it could ever end yes. and i think that's the perfect kind of ending where you're just like of course mm-hmm. you read the words and you're just like yes of course of course this is the only way it could have ended um but but you're right like he allows us to fill in the blank he allows us to say what is the next loop going to look like? What did the one before it look like? How many times has he done this? There's a great theory out there that the reason the number 19 is so significant to this story um, is because this is his 19th loop through this whole thing, mm-hmm. which there's no, I mean, there's no textual support for that at all other than the, the number 19 being significant. Mm-hmm. But I like it. I like it a lot. Um, I like it for several reasons. I mean, like, obviously this is a, this is a, um, watsonian reason <laughs> because mm-hmm. like doyalistically it's because the number 19 became very important to stephen king when he realized oh i wrote this thing when i was 19 and then i almost died on the 19th and then he kind of retroactively made this happen but within the story itself i think it really works and if you think back to the number 19 that drove um what's her name crazy back in tull maybe it's because she was shown 
the fact that this is all a loop and they've just lived it uh-huh. over and over and over again. And that was enough to drive her insane. Like, yeah. I, like there's, there's a lot, there's a lot of fun stuff there, but yeah, I mean, I, I like who, who it could be three different people. You're absolutely right. It could be who he needs to, to learn what lesson he needs to learn. And Jake, Eddie and Susanna got him this far this time. And maybe, so we, we give, we give them, we give them a break from this and it's three different people next time, or mm-hmm. maybe it's the same people. Maybe Jake is the same, but the other others are different because if he does choose to save Jake here, um, maybe then he will draw different people. Um, mm-hmm. because that experience will be different. We yeah. don't know. And, and I, I don't want to know. Right. I, I love, I love being able to just have those thoughts and, and not having a confirmed answer to it. And I know we've got another book to talk about in the series. Um, I can tell you now very clearly that this is a book that takes place in between some of our other books where Roland is just telling a story about something that happened in his past. So we're not going to learn any more about this loop stuff. And I hope Stephen King never writes another book that takes place after this yeah. one, because I don't want a definitive answer to any of that. Yes. I want my version of it. In, that is in my head to be the one. Yeah. Um, and in right. my head, in my head, this is it. In my head, he's Ka gave him the horn because it said, bro, you got really close and here's your reward for getting really close. This is it. You're going to do it this time. And he's going to make the right decision at this time. And he's going to finally be freed. He's going to finally get to rest. He's going to finally realize the things that are important and stick with those things and cry off from the stupid fucking tower. Yeah. Um, that's my internal version of it. And you might have a different one. Everyone has a different one. But that's that's a good fucking ending to me, yeah, man. Right. I mean, uh, the, we've talked so much about the metafictional aspects of the Dark Tower. And here, here are two more. Okay. Number one, he guarantees you're going to want to reread the book. <laughs> right. And, and makes that part of the book. Right. Mm-hmm. Like the book, the story itself now is is a different object to you now that you know this truth um number two you walk away from it like you just said imagining all of these things and 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 confabulating different possibilities for how it could have gone differently or how it could go differently next um Mm -hmm. and and that like that that's just fun you can have conversations like it's immediate conversation starter hey do you think do you think the next loop is gonna be the next loop like like is is it gonna be the last loop rather um it's just immediate fodder for the imagination and, and for something to chew on as you walk away from it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it kind of reminds me of something Frank Herbert said about Dune, how um, he ended it in what he intentionally designed to feel like the middle of a, 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 a of a beat sort of so that, I mean, I, and, and, and I, and I like slapped my forehead when I, when I read that he had said this, because I remember being a kid and reading the last words of the book and like turning the page and being like, am I missing some pages? Like this isn't, <laughs> this doesn't feel like an end. It feels like mm-hmm. we, it feels like he like drew in a breath to say the next thing. And then the book is over and it leaves you, it leaves you in a place where you're like, you're still in the world. And you're still thinking about it. And that is a, I think a great place for a, for a long series like this to end because it's almost like King is, he's he's handing it over to you he's like i i've told the story now here you, you know mm-hmm. your turn have fun yep yep and that's su- that's su- that's such a generous and beautiful thing to do for us right yeah i totally agree and and i, I i'm really i'm really conflicted about this concept of rereading right because there is as you said a metaphysical aspect of it is that roland is caught in this loop because we are rereading and rereading and rereading the story, right? Like how many times has Roland been in this loop? I don't know. How many times have you reread the story (laughs) because you're putting Roland, like, isn't it true that in the world of stories, every time you open up this book again, you're putting this poor character through the, the, the gauntlet again, Uh you're putting them through all this, this conflict and loss and grief and, horrible stuff and you never give them a break because you keep turning those pages you keep turning those pages if, if ka wh- what are we but ka right, right. like we I, I the the constant readers that just reread the story over and over and over again that put Roland through this stuff over and over and over again so i i, I love that i love that stephen king turns us to this metafictional aspect at the end because it's our fault. <laughs> I mean, it's his fault, but it's right. our fault too, because we chose to do this. 
and and I'm telling you, man, I've read this book four times. <laughs> I never don't read the coda. I, I know what uh-huh. happens. I mean, that's the amazing thing about the story is I know what happens. And I know because it's a book that it's not going to change. At least Roland has the hope that next time it will be different. But for me, it never will be different. <laughs> it never will. It is going to be the same every single time. And yet I read the fucking thing to the end every time anyway. Why? Well, I know what's going to happen. Why do I put the character through that? Because it's a story uh-huh. and it's great and it's fun. Yeah. And, 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 and the thing to, to get to what I think is, is the great work of genius is why do people reread the story, right? Why do, do I, why have I read the story four times? Why have people read the story 10 times, 20 times? Is it to find out what's at the tower at the end? No. Why is it? The characters, Eddie, Jake, Susanna, Oi, because we want to see these characters again, which is the exact lesson that Roland needs to learn, right? It doesn't matter what's at the end. The reason you go back to it, the reason you love it is because of the people. And that is the thing that he has not quite learned yet. Yeah, it's it's exactly what King said. It's like, I I hope you're not just... uh, uh I, not just munch your way through the pages to the ending which mm-hmm. which you know if, if you're rereading a book you're definitely not just munching your way through to the ending because you already know the ending and and you right. know that the ending is just the dark tower that's i mean that that's I, I think i said something last week about like the the magic doors being like books because they open into a new world and i'm like yeah yep. so the magic door at the top of this tower is just the dark tower mm-hmm. it just opens onto the dark tower and, and it's a, and you the, the the ending is just the book that you read mm-hmm. there's no surprises for you here other, other than the fact that indeed the story that you read is the point what, what's at the top of the tower is is a is a hollow victory it's 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 heroin it's it's the it's the um satisfaction with no meaning mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. I mean, it's a, it's a delightful ending, like, like just on the object level, it's a delightfully evil ending, right? <laughs> like it's, it's a wonderful, yes. like Stephen King twisted, um, horrible, ironic ending. And, and I, I love it on that level of, too, of course, like, just like, you know, uh, a, a wonderful sort of, sort of tragic fate for this character, which yeah. we, 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 we love Roland, but I think also we're just like, this is totally what you deserve, dude. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like this is the exactly right ending for, for, for the story that we just read. It, it is. And it, this is why I, I, there's so many reasons why I love this because we can both stand here going that eh, you got what you deserved, but we did it too. Like yeah. that's the thing is like, yeah. we didn't, we could have turned back Yeah, and me like you, at least you didn't know. Like Roland didn't know, but uh-huh. I'm worse. I knew uh-huh. <laughs> there's, there's no fucking reason why I need to read that coda again. I know what's going to happen, yeah. but I do it every single time. Sure. Well, I mean, and you can take delight in, in the iron and the, in the hypocrisy of that too. I mean, yes, yes, exactly. It's, <laughs> it's, 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 I mean, it's a book that kind of shoves our own kind of prurient, uh, uh, peeping Tom nature into our face. I'm mm-hmm, just like mm-hmm. you. Just want to watch these people suffer. I know the truth. Yes, yes. I mean, we do again and again. How many yeah. times have I watched Jake die? Yeah. How many times have I watched Eddie die? How many times have I watched Oi die? Yeah. Um, yeah. It breaks my heart every time, and yet I subject myself to it, and therefore them to it again right. and again and again. Yeah, yeah. And oh. I, I won't stop. I'm, I'm fucking rereading the books already via audiobook right yeah. now. I'm doing it again. I, I mean, I, I, I literally. St- started the gunslinger again just because i wanted <laughs> to see how this ending leads into that and, and like mm-hmm. what what elements and of course you know I, i'm sure everyone listening knows this like there's so many things toward the beginning of the gunslinger where you're just like ah, i see what you're doing there yep, i yep, mean there were yep. things i noticed that i never would have noticed like like um f- the farmer brown says that he's teaching zoltan he, he tried to teach zoltan the lord's prayer and it's like, okay, Lord's Prayer, that was an element from the end of the story where Susanna's saying yep. the Lord's Prayer. Yep. And it's a mirror, it's a mirror. It's it's the it's the it's the ring cycle. It's the um Yes. Um chiastic structure. It it is. It is but 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 used brilliantly. Yes. Isn't it? 
like you, not just like for its own sake it's like yes the best possible way you could use that structure yes mm-hmm. it, yeah it's so good and and yes we have to say because every time i mention this i get some emails by people like well yeah but he changed it he added that in and i was like yeah but i don't care <laughs> like right. this is this is the story as it is presented to us now so yes it is true that when you read the book the first time when it first came out all the stuff was not added to it yet but oh. that doesn't matter that's the story as he wants it to be presented now well see here's here's my sort of tongue-in-cheek interpretation is that the dark tower goes original version of the gunslinger drawing of the three um wastelands wolves song of Susanna, <laughs> dark tower revised version of the gunslinger that's the order <laughs> of the books there are uh, people that read the books in that that very order Yes. So they consider the revised version of the gunslinger to be the last book. Yeah. I mean, the okay. problem is he doesn't have the horn in that, so it, it can't be I, that exactly. But yeah, I, I, who cares? Who you, cares? You, you just just get your pencil and you just write. And there was a horn on his belt and then you just <laughs> and then it's fine. Yes. And he patted his horn for yeah. strength at one point. But he's still and let he Jake just, fall. So, yes, <laughs> <laughs> whatever. As Jake fell, he says, there are other worlds than these. Also, sweet horn, dude. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. There you go. Perfect. Uh, you, um, we fixed it. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, there's there's more we could talk about here. I guess the horn we're told symbolizes that that he could be different, that he could change, and we're kind of prepped it by it means he took the three seconds to to sit there. Um, is there anything else you can you can pull meaning from that? Um, what that represents well um i think the horn itself is you know a draft of the old times it's it's, yes. it's memory it's yes. it's um uh f- physically bothering to carry a totem of his of his past and his good memories that has no purpose other than to remind him of those things mm-hmm. um you know, to keep to keep keep his sights on the things that matter the most in his life, which are the people. Yes. The people that he's encountered, even the ones that he's lost, because like the thing is, you're never not going to lose people. Ka is going to take people away from Roland, whether or not he makes all the right choices or not. Right. Yeah. We, we've kind of seen that even in this version of the story. Right. That like he says, I will sacrifice myself for Jake. And Ka says, no, you won't. Yeah. Um, the question is not do you make the choice to to allow Jake to live? Sometimes the question is, what do you do once you have lost him uh, yeah. again? And he chose poorly. Right. I, I think, I think you, you could even call it like a symbol of a symbol that forces introspection because he's such like, you get the feeling, you know, when he's telling the story of Susan that he's never processed this grief. He's just, in, in, instead of dealing with his loss, he's just marched forward and, and thrown himself into the next trial and carrying this totem of his of his loss with him it it sort of continually confronts him with his loss and maybe maybe that means that he will actually have to confront his grief in in a in a you know in a more healthy way um uh instead Mm -hmm. of just ignoring it i think you're right i think you're absolutely right and i love that it it represents that Mm -hmm. um so We'll we'll never know for sure, but like we said, we all have our own theories, our own beliefs, our our own headcanon, and I like it that way. And um, I hope you all too. I I think so. The thing we can say: the reason my dad does not like this ending, and the reason many other people are disappointed by this ending, is because I still think they're on early trips to the tower. Right? I think for my dad, he was so excited to see what was at the top of this thing, and he felt let down by it um he's still roland on maybe like his first loop Uh (laughs) and 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 the thing is the thing the the reason i argue with my dad about this is because i really just want to be like dad if you read it again i think you'll i think you'll be there i think you'll get it and Uh i think you'll fall in love with it i really do and he won't he won't do it he won't my dad likes happy endings my dad likes and they lived happily ever after um, and he feels that Stephen King saying before the chapter that is disappointing and and in his mind lazy, which I completely disagree, him saying you're not going to like this ending doesn't excuse him from making an ending that he didn't like in, in his mind. Um, I don't agree with this at all. This is why we argue, because I yeah. believe literally I, the exact opposite. I mean, 
I think it's, I think I've made clear that I, the, I, I think independently came to my conclusion that, that obviously mm -hmm. that's not what this book is about. Um, and, and like the thematic meaning of him not learning his lesson and thus being condemned to repeat his, his struggle is laced throughout the entire saga. So, yep. So you 100%. can't, you can't say it's like a lazy ending. It's like, well, that's, it's the only possible ending. Yep. Like what yep, else that's... would be at the top of the tower? Like that, that, that was, I, and this is something I said a while ago, like what could it possibly be that would be worth this? Yes. What could yeah. it possibly be that would be worth losing all of your loved ones? Mm -hmm. It's nothing good. Yeah. I mean, this is the conversation I have with my yeah. dad over and over and over again, where I, I say like, wh what, what did you, what would you want it to be? And he's yeah. like, I don't know. He's the author. <laughs> yeah. But like, and I'm like, he's but, like, my dad will go like, so he writes this series, this, this thousands of pages, hundreds of thousands of word all about this guy trying to get to the top of a tower. And when he gets there, what's there? Nothing. And I'm like, yes, but that's the point, Dad. <laughs> this is this is the argument I have over and over and over again. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't. Yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm, I'm arguing with your dad, who's not here. But I, I like, I'd be <laughs> like, no, it's not nothing. It's 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 damnation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's it's a it's a door to his own personal hell, which is having to go through all of this again. Yep. Um, which is a delightfully evil ending, actually. Like, I I, I would never call it nothing, even if I found it terribly depressing i would still be like man that is that is just mean you know it, it is very mean yeah it's uh, we were told from the beginning that ka is not nice yes it's mean yes we, we we've been nothing if not forewarned that something like this was coming <laughs> oh yeah i mean and i i, I tried it in ways that I hope did not spoil the ending for you but also like primed you for it i i tried to highlight the moments peppered throughout this book and all the books in which we are kind of very explicitly told about this um yeah i i you you did not guess the time loop thing right like no was not, it was it even a, like was, was it even like a half-formed thought in the back of your head not that it was literally a was it a half-formed thought i mean I don't know how to answer that. Maybe <laughs> okay. like, like, like I know, I know that I've said stuff before about like, because th this story is full of time travel actually. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so I know I've said stuff before, like, like I remember points when like Eddie would hear a voice in his head back in Wolves of the Cala. And I was like, is this like a time traveling future version of Roland coming back to tell him something? Oh yeah. And, and by the way, every time you did that, you, you drove people in, insane. Yeah. In yeah the comments and, and but like that's not because i thought that the door at the top of the tower was a time loop i i yeah i just was recognizing like okay well there's a shitload of time travel in the story so stuff like that is totally on the table mm -hmm. um which yet again is why it's completely like a, a, a perfectly logical solution to the to the mystery of what is at the top of the tower it's like well it's a door that does time travel which is something you've seen like eight <laughs> times and so mm -hmm. This shouldn't really be that surprising even. Um, yeah. I also think last week you said something to the effect of, and as soon as we'll finish the books, we'll go back and read them again and just do the podcast over again. And that also uh, drove people insane, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> Excellent. And the funny thing is, like, I think some people were like, did he read ahead or did he guess? And I was just like, no, no, this is just, you weren't even thinking of that being the ending. It's just you were making a joke that just happened to fit perfectly. Yeah yeah all right this episode is very long so we need to wrap it up but we're not done talking about this book and this ending yet we are going to be back next week to talk about book seven as a whole we're going to spend some time really breaking down the structure of this whole book i'm sure we'll touch on the ending a little bit more um the other thing we're going to do is because it's our overview episode we are going to do another mailbag so we want you guys to send in your questions to us about this book it can be about the series as a whole or anything else you want us to, to answer. Is there something that you saw in this ending that you wanted us to talk about? Ask us about it, and we'll we'll dive into that. Um, so you can send those questions on, on our subreddit. You can email them to us. Um, any way you want to send us questions, we'll find them, and, uh, and we'll talk about them on the show next week. Yeah. So that's it. That's it. We'll be back next week for, for Book 7 Overview. 
All right. Yay. Awesome. Remember, you can reach out to us at kingslingerspod at gmail.com or on Twitter at kingslingerspod. And the subreddit r slash uh, doofmedia is the place. Um, I mean, you can ask your, your mailbag questions, any of those places. Um, but that is uh, the place where everybody can kind of see them. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. And if you're not already subscribed to Kingslingers, or it's the end of this book, but not the end of the show, as we've already said. So this still subscribe, do it. Um, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, Google Play, and pretty much anywhere else you can find our, you can find podcasts, podcasts. Yeah. Um, and if you like any of our shows and you want to support them, then please consider donating to our Patreon account at patreon.com slash doofmedia. Thank you uh, this month to Matt C. Uh, we hope you appreciate the cool stuff we have, and we hope you're uh, going to listen to our Misery podcast right after you finish listening to this one. Yes, Matt C. donated at the Doof Troop level on Patreon. That's our $10 level, which unlocks our bonus podcasts like other levels of the tower. And we, don't, we do more than just that bonus podcast. We, have, we try to have something out every Wednesday. That's our bonus podcast day. So if you donate at that level or any level above it, you get all of that stuff, that, that juicy content. So thank you, Matt, and to everyone who donates at that level. Yeah. And of course, if you cannot afford to donate to us, that is absolutely okay. You can always help us out by sharing the podcast with everyone. Um, this is a big, big episode. Maybe people that haven't been following us all the way through, that, but just wanted to hear people talk about the end of the show. This would be a really great one to share with them. Or not the end of the show, the end of the books. This would be a really great episode to share with those people. So maybe, maybe do that. Um, and of course, you can always help us out by leaving us a rating and a review. This week's spotlight review comes from John Greenstone, who gives us five stars and says, fun hosts, insightful analysis. These guys are so much fun to listen to. They're really sharp, too, which makes the podcast no, not only fun, but worth also worthwhile. They also play the way they play off each other while riffing on Stephen King's masterwork is great. Two thumbs up. Well, thank you so much, John. That was very nice. Yeah, thank you so much. And of course, thank you to everyone who has throughout this long journey to the tower left those rating and reviews. We really, really do appreciate it. And like we said, we're not done. So keep them, keep them coming. Yeah. All right, folks, that is it. We are finally finished with this episode and for real this time. It's not another fake out ending. We're really done. We're really going away now, but we will be back here next week to talk about our overview of book seven, The Dark Tower. Long days and pleasant nights. And may you have twice the number. Say thank you.